attention, please. Would members of the Government Management Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to call uh, meeting number 29 <clears throat> of the Government Management Committee to order. I'd like to welcome members of the committee and to other members of the council in attendance today and to members of the public. For those of you in the room with us, there's a screen in the very back corner uh, that provides real time updates concerning where we are on the agenda and what's coming up next. You can also follow the agenda and debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. Uh, the Government Management Committee gratefully acknowledges its meeting on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and it's home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. And before we uh, go through the agenda, I just want to, uh, we have somebody retiring today, but I believe they're not here yet. Not yet, so, not yet. so, <laughs> not yet, <coughs> you're next, <laughs> you're next. Uh, so we have a member of the civil service that's retiring that I'd like to acknowledge, but he's not here yet, so I'll do that when he arrives. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge Councillor Davis, who is retiring, and I'd like to thank Councillor Davis for all of your contributions to the Government Management Committee, no, I always enjoy having you here. Uh, I sat on with Councillor Davis, I think going back to when Mayor Miller, I was on the Community and Social Services, Community Development, I am not can't even remember what it was called then, but I enjoyed it when you were the chair of that committee. I've enjoyed working with you uh, both as a councillor, uh, as a, a staffer when I was here previously, uh, with Councillor Signaki, and I also want to acknowledge your friendship over the years and advice and uh, guidance on different things as well, both City Hall and personal. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a, a long, happy, healthy retirement. And we're going to miss you. Mr. Chair. May I also say something? Good morning, Councillor Fletcher. Good morning. Yes, you may. Uh, I have to add my voice to yours. Uh, there's no one in City Council who knows contracts, who knows the language, who knows the numbers, 
who uh, is such an important part of labor relations for this city uh, on that front. And uh, I think that she'll be sorely missed for her deep going knowledge, her thorough study of every issue. Whether you agree with her or not, you know she knows what she's talking about. She knows her facts. And there are too often people don't know their facts, but talk anyway. Councillor Davis, you always know your facts. And I just want to thank you for your years of leadership on this committee. You have chaired other committees. You chaired community development recreation while you were here and uh, through a whole number of recreation changes and also a champion for childcare. So that should be recognized here today at this standing committee. So I just wanted to add my voice to that. Mr. Thank Chair. you, Councillor Fletcher. <laughs> Did you want to say anything, Councillor Davis? Or are you saving it for council? <laughs> I will say something. I, I did, um, yes, I, I, I want to thank you for your kind words first, obviously. Um, and it's true, I, I do read my reports and I do try to be prepared for council and I do try to read even the most boring procurement reports or the most boring real estate reports. Um, or the most exciting policy uh, reports, because I know that the people behind those reports put in a lot of time and energy, and are, that is evidence of their work. And if you don't read and reflect and discuss that work, then you are not giving an acknowledgement to the incredible work that our staff in the corporate side, corporate services side, do. You know, so often we talk about, you know, all of the programs and services we deliver, but we forget that the back of house functions that we discuss in this committee are exceptionally important. Everything from finance to real estate to HR, legal services, corporate, all those corporate services, um, they keep the city going and functioning well. And uh, I want to acknowledge the work of all of the divisions that come here every month and uh, deliver their services every day on behalf of the people of Toronto. So nice. thank you very, very much for the work that you do all the time. Thank you, Councillor Davis. And as the chair, I would just like to acknowledge and thank all the staff as well. Uh, this is our last meeting for this term of the Government Management Committee. I've been the, the chair twice now of the Government Management Committee, uh, back when Mayor Ford asked me to, to be the chair. And I was like, wow, government management. And I looked at all the different areas that the, the city looked after. And, I was, I, and uh, a friend of mine called me that had worked for years in Ottawa. And people are like, what does government management do? So I was trying to explain it to them. And my friend called me from Ottawa and he was all excited. He's like, Paul, he's like, you're the chair of the government management committee. He's like, you're going to see how government runs. You're going to see how it functions. It might not always be the most glamorous, but he said, you're going to keep the city of Toronto running. He says, the best part is people might not always know what you're doing, but he said, you know, you're going to have your finger in everybody's pie. Your committee is uh, very exciting without it. The city of Toronto couldn't run. And I've come to a deep understanding that that's, you know, 100% true. If we didn't have the amazing staff here in the number of different departments, I can't name all of them. Um, but I do want to thank you for all the hard work and the dedication that you put in. We have uh, one of, we had somebody retire uh, last month that had worked for over 30 years for the City of Toronto. Uh, there's a gentleman that we're waiting to come in this morning. Maybe he doesn't want all the public uh, accolades, but he's worked for the city for 44 years. And I think it just goes to show you the dedication uh, and diligence and perseverance and respect that people have for the City of Toronto in their role in our civil service. And I just want to thank you for everyone for all of your hard work and your dedication. And I would also like to thank the members of the clerk's uh, department that are here to my right, the three uh, members of the clerk's department that keep us out of trouble. Uh, sometimes we have motions on the fly. Um, I have to be reminded of things I should be doing even after eight years. Um, so I want to thank all of you for all of your hard work and dedication as well. And it's been an honour being the chair of the Government Management Committee. Thank you very much. And saying that, so we're just going to go through the agenda.
Uh, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, I need a motion to confirm the minutes of our June 5th, 2018 meeting. Councillor Troisi is moving them. All in favour? Carried. Uh, speakers and presentations are on the green sheet. Um, so item number one is the apportionment of property taxes for July 3rd, 2018. It's for a 9.45 a.m. hearing. So we're just going to come back to that one. Uh, number two is the cancellation, reduction, or refund of property taxes as of July 3rd, 2018. It's also a 9.45 a.m. hearing. So I'll hold that. Number three is 5 Bartonville Avenue East, designation of the property used by the Urban Arts Community Arts Council as a municipal capital facility. It's in Ward number 11. Yes, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just for a second, I just want to thank staff for the report on the agenda. Thank you very much. I, I know we worked on it for a while, so thank okay. you. And if I can have a member move that. All right, that's an amazing organization. Councillor Davis, you move it on Councillor Nunziata's behalf. Yes. All in favor of the recommendations in number three. Carried. Uh, number four, 50 Sousa Mendez Street, designation of the property to be used by the Christie Ossington Neighborhood Center as a municipal capital facility or the George Chavallo Neighborhood Center. It's in ward number 18. Councillor Troisi is moving the recommendations in report number four. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number five is the 305 Dawes Road designation of the property as a municipal capital facility in Ward 31. Councillor Davis. Um, I will move adoption and also thank staff uh, for getting this done within this term. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councillor Davis is moving the recommendations in number five. All in favor? Carried. Number six is the amendments to the Victoria University Act bylaw for phasing in of municipal taxes in Ward 27. Councillor Davis, I see you thinking. Um, that's okay. I'm trying to restrain myself. <laughs> okay. Councillor Troisi, you're moving the recommendations. All in favor Number of number six, carried. Uh, number seven, write off of uncollectible property taxes from the tax rule. Councillor Davis? Move adoption. Councillor Davis is moving adoption of the recommendations in number seven. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number nine, the Corporation of the City of York Pension Plan proposed merger with the OMERS plan, implementation of OMERS indexing. You missed eight. I missed eight. Sorry, we're going back to number eight at the bottom. Sorry. Thank you, Carol. I'd like to hold number eight. Councillor Davis is holding number eight. All right. Now we're on number nine. The Corporation of the City of York Employee Pension Plan proposed merger with the OMERS plan, implementation of OMERS indexing. Councillor Crisanti is moving number nine. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number 10, merger of pre-OMERS pension plan with OMERS and proposal for sharing of surplus funds. I would like to hold that. Uh, number 11, Corporation of the City of York Employee Pension Plan Funding Valuation Report as of December 31st, 2017. Councillor Troyfees is moving number 11. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number 12 is the award of a request for proposal 306-18-0221 for the tax and utility printing, mailing and design services, e-billing services, PDF services, Supply of e-post and fillable form services. Councillor Davis, did you want to debate it? I will move adoption. All right. Councillor Davis is moving number 12. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number 13, Friends of Toronto Public Cemeteries versus the Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries. It's a report on the city's interests, and I have one deputant on that, so we're going to hold that. Number 14 is Bill 170 Schedule, Bill 177, Schedule 35, a general overview and potential impact on municipal operations. I have one deputant on that. We'll hold that. Uh, number 15 is a 250-year-old oak tree at 76 Coral Gable Drive. There's two deputants on that, so we will hold that. Direction authorized, sorry, number 16 is the direction authorized the implementation of shared services 
recommendation, insure the city's vehicles under the Toronto Transit Commission Insurance Company Limited. I'll move adoption. Councillor Davis moving adoption on number 16. All in favor, carried. Number 17, extension of the service agreement for the collection of municipal land transfer tax. Move adoption. Councillor Davis moving adoption number 17. All in favor, carried. Number 18, contract award for request for proposal number 9144-18-0058 for the supply and delivery of way scale solution for transfer station efficiencies project. Councillor Crisanti is moving adoption of the recommendations. All in favor? Carried. Number 19, amendment to purchase order number 6045978, Casa Loma Phase 9 structural repairs for the perimeter wall restoration. Sorry, Councillor Tracy, hold it. Move it. Oh, okay. Councillor Tracy is moving the recommendations and number 19. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number 20 is the Indian Residential School Survivors IRSS Legacy Structure, and there's uh, three deputants. Sorry, let me turn the page. There's three deputants on this item. Uh, number 21 is the food delivery, food service opportunity at City Hall. It's an update. I'd like to hold that. Councillor Davis is holding number 21. Uh, number 22 is the Union Station Revitalization Project status report. Anybody? Councillor Choice is moving number 22. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number 23 is the relocation of the ML Ready Mix Concrete Batching Facility, purchase of 29 Judson Street, and lease out of 545 Commissioner Street. I have some questions. I... Councillor Davis has questions. We'll hold that under Councillor Davis's name. Uh, number 24 is the Northwest Path Extension from Union Station to Wellington Street. This is the Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Addendum, Schedule C. And there's three deputants on that, so I'm gonna hold that. Uh, number 25 is the acquisition of a portion of 55 Lakeshore Boulevard East. Councillor Choice is moving recommendations in number 25. All in favor, carried. Uh, number 26 is the lease with the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 344 at 1395 Lakeshore Boulevard West at Blow Market Rent. It's in Ward 14. I'll move adoption. Councillor Davis is moving adoption of the recommendations in number 26. All in favor? Carried. Number 27 is the expropriation of 300 Commissioner Street in Ward 30. Anybody want to hold it? Move it. I'll move adoption. Councillor Davis is moving adoption to number 27. All in favor? Carried. Number 28 is the real estate acquisitions and expropriation of property interest near the Donland subway station for the easier access phase three and secondary exit projects in Ward 29. Go ahead. No, no. Okay, Councillor Crisanti is moving number 28. All in favor? Carried. Number 29 is the Integrated Telecommunications Infrastructure Agreement. I'd like to hold that. Councillor Davis is holding number 29. Number 31 is exploring active transportation op options in city facilities and maintenance. We've got 30. Sorry, did I miss 30? Sorry, Carol. Thank you. Uh, number 30 is the Fair Wage Policy Non-Compliance for the Lowi Brothers Concrete Contractors Limited. And we have a speaker. Thanks, Carol. Number 31. Exploring active transportation options in city facilities and maintenance. Councillor Tracy is moving number 31. All in favor? Carry. Uh, number 32 is an OMERS update on plan design options. Oh. Okay, there is a presentation. I yes, by Omers. Mr. Chair. I'm not sure why we're having a presentation. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yeah, I don't think we need a presentation. 
we may we discussed this at last at the last committee meeting. We asked for a staff report and didn't get one because the timelines were too tight. Um, it's very clear they. I'd like to speak to it, but I don't think we need a presentation. Do you want to so, speak to it now? I'm happy to speak to it now. Go ahead. I have a motion, a technical amendment on this. I'm looking for more information, but it doesn't have anything to do with the presentation. Okay. Well, I don't know if the Omer's people are here, um, but we made our position very clear last month, and I hope Joe is listening in particular as our representative, Councillor Fletcher. <laughs> Um, we made our position very clear and council endorsed it, that we called on the board to delay the November 30th deadline. It's very clear you haven't done that. I hope that our representatives uh, advocated that position at the board because that was the direction we gave. Secondly, we opposed de-indexation. That was very clear. It was unanimously adopted by city council and I hope our representative on the board was able to express that position as our representative. But otherwise, we have no reasonable opportunity to actually put together a thoughtful and comprehensive response. So there's no point in you making a presentation today and we sit here and somehow we're supposed to do something with that. We can't do anything with that. We have, a, without a staff report, that gives us clear, clearer information and advice and council taking a position on this formally. I think a presentation is, uh, it, it, it just, it's not helpful in any way. If you don't extend the deadline and give this council, this corporation a chance to formally review the options and take a position and approve it by council, then there's no point in having this presentation today. We've already taken our position on de-indexation, which is clearly one of, the, it is the key recommendation that you've made. And I know that you're going to say, well, it's just for consultation, but the board, sponsor's board approved it and is recommending it as a solution for consultation, a change to the plan. And uh, anyway, um, that's all I have to say. We can take these away with us, your presentation, but this council is not going to be able to consider um, in a thorough and thoughtful way, meaningful way, and give you any meaningful. We, we pay 18% of the contributions to OMERS. 18%, $389 million a year we give to OMERS. And you don't have the respect to give the municipalities in this province a chance to respond adequately? You have a consultation period during the election period? You have a consultation deadline in which the municipalities have no chance to respond? And the school boards? That is so disrespectful. So, you know, I, 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 I can't tell you how angry I am about this that that position was not reflected by the, by the sponsor's board last week. You debated it on the very day that council approved the uh, position and uh, you knew what the position was. And yet, um, I'm not even sure because we don't get access to those, that decision making process, whether or not that was the position taken by our representatives. But um, anyway, I don't think we need a presentation it's unfortunate. I don't know how the city will be able to respond beyond what we've done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Davis. Did anybody else want to speak on this item? Seeing none, so I have a motion that, so it's a technical amendment. Uh, request Omer's Administrative Corporation a report to the Treasurer on how it calculates and reports contributions of the City of Toronto and agencies, boards and commissions and direct the treasurer to forward the report from the Omar's Administrative Corporation to the Government Management Committee. And so I put this motion forward because the information that we got last month, I don't think was comprehensive enough. I don't think that we got an, 
an, uh, an outline or all of the information uh, on our pension contributions from the City of Toronto employees, but more importantly, its agencies, boards and commissions, such as the police department and the Toronto Zoo. I think that information was missing from the report. I'm gonna echo Councillor Davis's words as well. Uh, we had the Omers, uh, rep our two representatives here last month that are appointed by the City of Toronto, uh, our city manager that represents the city interests at the two boards at Omers. Uh, we passed a motion that clearly outlined the government management committee would not support the de-indexing of Omers pensions, that we wanted a comprehensive public process that we could engage and give our feedback. The City of Toronto's OMERS members make up the largest portion of the, the OMERS uh, contributions. Uh, we have two representatives on the board. I think that, um, so what we passed here, government management, it was passed here unanimously. It went to Toronto City Council. It was passed there unanimously. And I haven't seen much change in the consultation process on the slide deck that was provided to me. It says that if you go to the very last page, it says a final decision will be made in November. We have a city council. Our final city council meeting is in July. Uh, we break then until December. So there is no ability for this council to give any feedback to Omers. But I think we made a, a decision at this committee. It was endorsed unanimously at Toronto City Council that we do not want to see the pension index, pension plan de-indexed. Um, so I don't think we want to be looking at options. That's what we want as the City of Toronto. Thank you. So I have this motion here. All in favor of the motion. Item as amended. No item as amended. All right. Okay. All right, and sorry, before we go back to the rest of the agenda, where's Derek? Mr. Brown, I would like to acknowledge, uh, just to deviate from the agenda, I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Derek Brown. Uh, I wanna ask the committee to acknowledge the long service of Mr. Brown as a senior solicitor in our municipal law group and legal services, who has announced his attention to retire effective July 31st, 2018, after 44 years of service with the City of Toronto. Uh, just a bit of background, Derek was admitted to the practice of law in 1968 after practicing for four years in Guelph, taking a couple of years off to attend music school in California. He made the excellent decision of joining the legal department in the former municipality of Metropolitan Toronto in 1974. During his time at Metro and after amalgamation in 1980, 1998 the city of, with the City of Toronto, Derek practiced extensively in a wide variety of legal areas, including information and technology law, housing services and governance matters for Metro Toronto Housing Corporation and the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, as well as pension matters, including most recently advising on the merger of the pre-amalgamation pension plans into OMERS, which we have on our agenda today. Another great milestone which Derek achieved this year was his designation as a life member of the Law Society of Ontario in March, an honour bestowed on lawyers who have practiced law in Ontario for over 50 years. Derek is also an accomplished musician. We hope to, he has ample opportunity to pursue the calling as part of a long and well-deserved retirement. Derek, I hope you have a long, happy, healthy retirement. I want to thank you for all your years of service to not only the City of Toronto, uh, but the people here that uh, we represent as councillors. I'm sure your colleagues are all going to work, miss your work, um, but I'm, I'm sure you'll pop by in once in a while and have a cup of coffee with them. Thank you so much. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> no. no. All right. <laughs>
Maybe we should have brought some instruments and he could have played something <laughs> for us. What do you play, Derek? Well, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> okay, we are back to number one. So the number one is the apportionment of property taxes for July 3rd, 2018. Where did Councillor Davis go? Sorry, we're just gonna have a brief musical interlude while I look for Councillor Davis. Derek, you're up. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't vote on anything without Councillor Davis. Maybe she's just going to check on her pension. <laughs> okay. Hmm? Is she? All right. We usually get our pension updates by mail. There's Councillor Davis. Just checking on your pension, Councillor Davis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are on uh, number one, apportionment of property taxes for July 3rd, 2018. I don't have any deputants listed on here. Is there anybody in the room that would like to make a presentation to the committee on item number one? Anybody for item number one? Going on last time. Nobody for item number one. So I do have a motion that recommendation one in the report be deleted and replaced with the following. The Government Management Committee approve the apportionment of property taxes and the amounts identified in Appendix A under the columns entitled apportion tax and apportion phase in slash capping, excluding the following application. Ward 36, uh, sorry, an address in Ward 36, not the entire ward, for the tax year 2017, known the property address is 160 Audrey Avenue and also in Ward 36 for the 2018 tax year, 100, sorry, 160 Audrey Avenue. All in favor of the amendment? Carried. All in favor of the item as amended? Carried. We're then on to item number two, which is also a timed hearing for the cancellation reduction or refund of property taxes as of July 3rd. 2018. Uh, I don't have anybody listed to depute. I do need to ask if there's anybody that would like to depute on this item. Anybody that would like to depute on item number two? And a third time, anybody on item number two? And I have a motion that recommendation number one be amended to read as follows. The Government Management Committee approve the individual tax applications made pursuant to section 323 of the City of Toronto Act 2006 resulting in tax deductions excluding phase in or capping amounts identified in the detailed hearing report marked as Appendix A, excluding the following applications. Appeal number 201-600-773 in Ward 20, known as 291 College Street, and appeal number 201-80016 in Ward 6, known as 2067 Lakeshore Boulevard West, Unit 2. All in favor of the amendment? Carried. Item as amended. All in favor? Carried. And sorry, just our next uh, matter on item number 20, the Indian Residential School Survivors Legacy Structure. The deputants have another obligation and asked if they could make their presentation first and we'll deal with this item. If the committee's fine with that. The committee's fine with that. So we're gonna to go to item number 20, the Indian, Res Indian Residential School Survivors Legacy Project. Uh, we have three deputants.
for yeah. later in the day because the deputants aren't here or if I'm the only one here. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so we asked for it to be timed up to the uh, okay. first. So we can put it last. That's okay. It looks so Probably sometime between 12 and 12.30. That's, that's good. That's, that's good. good. Okay. All right. So you're going to... I'm going to go to item number 13. You're going to move that to the last item. Yeah. So we're going to move number 20 to the last item on the agenda. And we'll now move to number 13, Friends of the Toronto Public Cemeteries versus the Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries. Report on the city's interests. There's a confidential attachment. And we have one speaker, Ms. Margaret Boyd, Friends of the Toronto Public Cemeteries. Is Margaret Boyd here this morning? Morning, Ms. Boyd. Uh, there's three speakers there in front of you. You can pick whichever one you like. Have a seat. Uh, what we do here, so you have five minutes to make a presentation. Uh, at that point, any member of the outside councillors or a member of the committee can ask you questions for up to five minutes. Then we uh, bring it back into committee. We can ask questions of staff on this item, and then we can either move the item, the uh, report that's before us, or make amendments to it. So you have five minutes whenever you're ready. Have a seat. Um, the speaker turns on. There's a button in front of you. I think it's yellow. You press that, it should light up and your speaker's on. And the clock, the timer's on that wall over there and you have five minutes whenever you're ready. Like no pressure. Break. Take your time. So is the mic on? Oh, okay, thanks. My name is Margot Boyd. I am the great, great, great granddaughter of Sir John Beverly Robinson, Attorney General of the Legislature of Upper Canada in 1826, who, along with other people such as William Lyon Mackenzie, created a public trust now known as Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries. Glenn Timney of Mount Pleasant Group likes to characterize me as just someone with a bad case of sour grapes over a visitation center that was built in my neighborhood. On the contrary, I'm very grateful every day for what happened because otherwise I would be unaware of the usurpation of the good works of my ancestor and other public advocates nearly two centuries ago. Glenn Timney trivializes the public's investment in the trust because it's only $300. The purchase price was actually paid in pounds sterling, and the investment was in six acres of land at Young and Bloor. The value of the public's original investment is incalculable. The valuation I received from MPAC seven years ago assessed the current cemetery properties at approximately $2 billion. If Toronto loses this 1,200 acres of green space, we can never get it back. Mr. Timney also says that MPGC has grown to what it is today without any funding, grants, or subsidies from any level of government or any public fundraising. This is utterly false, as MPGC's Special Act legislation from my grandfather gives them immunity from all taxation, meaning that all three levels of government subsidize MPGC every year to the tune of millions of dollars. You have not had the benefit of reading the submissions to Superior Court, only getting a report from the city solicitor, some of which I can see and some advice that I cannot. From what I can see, this is a report that at minimum contains errors, omissions and red herrings. My colleague Pamela Taylor has addressed some of those in a supplementary document that, they sh that you should have that I submitted and she submitted. I am providing you with a number of other supporting documents that the, that the city solicitor has not reviewed but would benefit from reviewing. The matter is complex and I cannot speak sufficiently to it in five minutes, so I am submitting some other important materials for you to review today. I would recommend that you take the time to sufficiently educate yourselves as the issue is too important to the citizens of Toronto for you to make a rushed decision here today. I have seen from the lobbyist records that you have been lobbied by Sussex Strategy Group and perhaps taken some time to listen to them, a luxury that as a regular Toronto citizen, I have not been accorded. 
One of the submissions I am providing is a chronology of events with supporting attachments regarding the stealth privatization of the 10 cemeteries that comprise this public asset rightfully belonging to the citizens of Toronto. This information has been put together by a team of people, including lawyers, an accountant, a financial researcher, and a real estate fraud investigator. The ex experts have all agreed to make themselves available to you to answer questions. Please ask the city solicitor to take advantage of the services of experts in these fields so that a thorough investigation may be conducted. MPGC has opened a door for you with the new bylaw 52, making the city of Toronto a beneficiary upon dissolution. I cannot state strongly enough the importance of the city of Toronto of raising its voice at Superior Court to protect its irreplaceable cemetery trust parklands. And I cannot imagine why you would not. I'm including a draft motion in the papers that I gave you that should be utilized by the City of Toronto for intervener status in the court case which determines the fate of hundreds of acres of Toronto's public trust parklands. If I, the other members of Friends of Toronto Public Cemeteries, and Kristen Wong Tam in her private capacity, lose this legal case on August 20th and 21st, the province of Ontario will have accidentally divested of $2 billion of land to people who now represent themselves as the board of MPGC. And the city of Toronto will have lost hundreds of acres of its own irreplaceable land. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Are there any questions for the deputant? Councillor Davis. I'm trying to understand. Uh, so your position is, um, well, you've said the city solicitor has not reviewed other documents um, in the preparation, I guess, of this report or the position of the city of Toronto. Um, how do you know that? I spoke with my lawyer again this morning and I reconfirmed with them. I said, did you give this? Did you give that or whatever? He said that nobody takes his call and nobody's received things from him. He, he says he keeps trying to get in touch with people and he doesn't get anybody at the city. Who are your lawyers? I'm just Gowlings. Gowlings. Actually, it's, it's you know, okay. it's every, this the city of Toronto ha now has Gowlings as their lawyers to protect this. So your position is that we ought to intervene? Absolutely. Okay. There's a, there's a Parks and Environment Committee and, and you're looking for new land. You know, why, why not keep the land that you have? I, I don't understand, do you know? So the, the Mount Pleasant group assumed this land? Yes, what I did was I provided you with a detailed chronology of the privatization of the public trust. It's taken years with people who are in forensic land fraud, and one of them said to me, this is the most beautiful fraud he's ever seen. I can't, I, th those are his words, not mine. I can't use the word be that because it's a finding of a judge. All I can do is present to you a chronology of events, and each one is supported by a document, so, you know. You'll have to make your own conclusion, but I included it all there. And is there another speaker? No. Nope. Okay, so this part two is, what is this document? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know which document you're referring to. It's the Mount Pleasant Memorial Services, 2913.3, Consolidated Financial Statements. Okay, what, what happened is that, um, did you submit this? Uh, yeah, I did, because what happened is that... Oh, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in 1997, three people created a new organization. It was a private corporation. Three people created a private corporation in 1997 and decided to call it Mount Pleasant Memorial Services. It is a private corporation and it had no assets. The people of this corporation then claimed that they were the owners of Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries, which is the 1,200 acres and the public trust. I kid you not, it's, it's absolutely gobsmackingly unbelievable. Unbelievable, okay? And then we tripped over this. This is what I said, the visitation center. Then things weren't adding up. Things didn't make sense. So we had a, 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 
a legal firm make a review of the legislation that set this up. And they said that the way these people represented themselves in 2006, they said they were a commercial privately owned cemetery. No, they're not. They were paid for entirely by the citizens of Toronto. So you would like us to uh, what would you think if we sent this off to our city solicitor for consideration? You're saying they yes. haven't seen it? Uh, no. Uh, my understanding is that these things haven't been sent to the city solicitor. I don't, I don't understand. Okay. I don't understand why they don't have them. Okay? okay. I, I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable because then when we brought the court case in April 2013, the, three, the individuals who created that corporation, Mount Pleasant Memorial Services, then suddenly dissolved it. And the reason I included these financials are because these financials for 2012 for Mount Pleasant Memorial Services are a private company. It could have been Fred's Bagels. Okay, and you're also saying... And they, sorry, and they said that they owned, in these financials, you'll see that they own 10 cemeteries, two funeral homes, and five visitation centers. They suddenly are owners and operators of all the assets of the public trust. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Are there questions of the deputy? None? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyd. Uh, questions of staff? Yeah. Councillor Choisey? Given the uh, information by the deputant, uh, has legal reviewed enough documentation in order to make the recommendations that are in the report? Councillor, we, we believe so. Um, maybe I can just give you a little extra background. Ms. Boyd is here on behalf of the applicant. Now, the applicant here started this litigation back in 2013. They're the party that initiated the litigation. They're the party that decides who are interested parties and who should be named as a respondent. So they did not name the City of Toronto. They named the province, and we think they're properly named, and also the public guardian trustee. So we don't have all the materials in the litigation. It's quite lengthy. It's been going on for five years. Uh, we do have their notice of application, and we have the factums that have been served and filed. So this is at the end of the process. The matter is scheduled to be heard in August. And the public guardian and trustee is there representing the public interest, and they are partially supporting the position advanced by the applicant. And just one other question. The hearing's in August, so it's, it's next month, is it not? That's correct. August 20th, and all the parties who are actively participating agreed on a court schedule, and all of the material has been served and filed. Okay, great, thank you. Good, Councillor Choisey. Good, Councillor Davis. Sorry, I saw Councillor Crisanti and then Councillor Davis. Just one question. I, it, it, there's a confidential attachment here, so I'm not sure if, if some of these questions should be in camera. And uh, so, in, in, is, is there, um, what is the city's interest here? Can that be asked publicly? What, what exactly is there an interest? Well, from what we can determine from the materials we have, the application focuses on internal governance issues, mm -hmm. and that's where the public guardian trustee has actively participated in the litigation as to whether it should be determined that the lands are considered to be held by a charitable trust. The uh, Mount Pleasant Group's position is that it's a statutory trust. So there are somewhat complex issues based on old provincial legislation and trust issues. But our position is that, that those issues are adequately represented by the public guardian trustee. And you don't feel we should participate or intervene in any way? We did not see the need for the city to directly participate, and it's very late in the day to even consider that. We don't see that we have something unique to add mm -hmm. to the positions that are already adequately represented by the parties. All right, thank you. Councillor Davis. 
Don't we have a huge interest in making sure that these lands remained remain essentially as public lands? They, they constitute what is essentially a massive park in the center of our city. Uh, isn't it important for us to, uh, to, to assert some kind of position? Are you saying it's too late now? Well, there's no suggestion from what I could see in the materials that the lands are not going to be used in perpetuity for cemetery purposes. The Mount Pleasant group essentially says that that those lands are held for, in, by way of a statutory trust and they will always be used for that purpose. Wait, wait. Sorry. No. Um, Sorry, Ms. Boyd. Anyway, you, is there any You got harm, your five minutes. Is, is there any harm in sending these documents back to you and asking you to review them and to report back to us? No, I mean, we can have okay. a look at anything further that has been submitted and we can do a supplementary report to council. Okay. Does that sound good, Councillor Davis? Or, sure. Sorry, Councillor Davis, is that the end of your questions? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Speakers? I don't know whether there are any others. Sorry, Councillor Davis is still writing. I'm just going to ask one more question. Um, just for clarity, the cemeteries would still be uh, accessible for public use, regardless. Yeah, there's no suggestion that that is going to change. I am. There's no uh, relief sought that really directly affects that. Yes. There was also in this submission some suggestion about, you know, that there's a new bylaw 52 making the City of Toronto a beneficiary upon dissolution. Could you explain that? Uh, we've been provided with that information. It looks like it was a bylaw passed in 2013. Right? Um, we've been provided it. Um what we can advise is that there's no relief sought in the application that would have the effect of, of, uh, of dissolving Mount Pleasant uh, cemeteries or any of the, the corporate entities in which it owns land. So while there may be a bylaw that's been enacted by, by Mount, Mount Pleasant Group that provides uh, certain process for what would happen to their real property assets upon dissolution, that doesn't really arise in what's being sought in the application. That is a fact that you're aware of and that that might indicate an interest in, on our part. It's a fact that we're aware of, but in our, in our view, it doesn't indicate an, an interest on our part because even if the applicants were successful in their proceeding, it wouldn't engage that bylaw because they're not seeking relief that would dissolve the Mount, Mount Pleasant group. Okay. Does this group have, why do they call it a group? Is it more than Mount Pleasant Cemetery? Um, so there, I mean, the, the corporate name of the respondent in the proceeding is the Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries. Um, the applicants take issue with uh, the corporate uh, entity which owns some of the real property assets um, uh, that are we commonly know as the as the cemetery, and that's one of the issues in the in the no, in the no. proceeding. What I'm asking is, do they have maybe I'll ask it differently? Do they have one, more than one cemetery? Yes, they have a, a, a variety of cemeteries, not just. How, the, how many would they have in Toronto? I believe there's also one in Scarborough, and and there's also some that are in the GTA. So I don't specifically know the ones that are outside of the city itself, but my understanding is there may there's some in other GTA municipalities. So they hold a lot of land. Uh, yes, in, in, in some capacity they do. That we ought to be concerned about if, as we know, these kinds of 
open green spaces are benefiting from tax relief and are benefiting the communities uh, because they function as parks, essentially, as well. Well, we've we've based the comments in the um, in the staff report on the relief that's being sought in the proceeding, and um, as my as my colleague Ms. Ms. Dimmer mentioned, the relief sought in the proceeding is largely related to internal governance matters, um, which doesn't have any direct effect on the manner in which the land is currently used or is proposed to be used in the future. What uh, the corporate structure, the ownership, the legitimacy of the board, and the way they function if they are in control of hectares of land in our city is not something we might be concerned about? So they're not seeking any relief in the proceeding that would invalidate or declare any previous or future decision that has been made as being invalid. So they're seeking uh, relief principally relating to the manner in which the board is elected, um, but they're not seeking any specific relief that uh, we see as engaging any city interest. No, my question was, so we, are, we have no concern about the corporate structure or the legitimacy of the board? Um, do you have anything to add, Diana? I don't, I, I haven't seen anything in the material we have reviewed to raise concerns along those lines. That from the city perspective, the uh, Mount Pleasant group, again, I repeat, has indicated that the lands are to be used in perpetuity for cemetery purposes. No, my question was about, my question was, do we not have any concerns about the corporate governance or the legitimacy of the board? I don't, I don't believe so, uh, okay. Councillor. And, and uh, so I you repeat again that if there are concerns along those lines, that's, that's the responsibility from a public perspective of the public guardian and trustee, and they are partially supporting the applicant in this manner. And they're heavily involved and have re reviewed the materials and actively participated. Okay, well, then I, I'll speak. I have a motion. that uh, the city solicitor, I thought well, I was gonna refer this matter to the city solicitor. Well, review the communication from the deputant and any other written submissions and report directly to council on the materials submitted. No, could I just, I, just Sorry. if I could speak to it a, a bit. Um, okay. I, I, I'm struggling a bit to understand why we wouldn't um, have uh, some concern and or interest in this matter. And um, I would hope that our city solicitor um, would have received and or communicated with, received the documentation and communicated with um, the applicant's legal counsel. It sounds like that didn't happen. Um, I don't know if that's, I didn't get a chance to ask that directly, but um, I, I hope that that did happen. And um, I do, I am concerned if there's legitimacy to the concerns about the governance and um, the question of, I guess, um, maintaining the, these lands uh, for public access from now and into the future, um, I think we should have an interest in that. So if we can review, if you could review whatever documents um, they have in advance of the meeting and report, that would be helpful. 
Okay, questions of the mover? Well, Councilor, Chris you're good? Okay, any other speakers on this item? So we have one motion before us, all in favor? Opposed? All in favor? <laughs> Carry. Item is amended. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. All right. And our next item. <laughs> I voted. We took it as unanimous. I did see your finger move, Councillor Davis. <laughs> Uh, item number 14, Bill 177, Schedule 35, General Overview and Potential Impact on Municipal Operations. Derek Moran. Derek, you know all the procedures and process, so I'll let you start whenever you're ready. I just want to say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied in doing so as fraud. God bless Her Majesty the Queen and long live Her Majesty the Queen. So in this report, it says, the strengthening of fine enforcement tools in the new version of the POA, um, which still lacks the enacting clause, I checked, required of it by Section 6 of the Legislation Act, making it invalid of no force or effect, has the potential to increase city revenues, multiple administrative default penalties and order of payment of defaulted fines may motivate those with defaulted fines to pay, Actual financial impact will depend on the behavior of individuals with defaulted fines. So I just want to point out that the City of Toronto goes around charging people with laws, really statutory rules in maritime jurisdiction that don't actually apply to them. And then the City of Toronto acts surprised when these people don't want to pay the fines that don't actually apply to them. So speaking of behavior, I just want to point out to the City, take notice that this is the behavior that the courts expect of administra administrative tribunals as the, uh, the city of Toronto has now. This is from Multani versus Commission Scolaire Marguerite Bourgeois, 2006. The Supreme Court of Canada said, the same reasoning applies in the context of administrative law. Like the courts, administrative tribunals are bound by the Canadian Charter. They're enabling legislation and the statutes they are specifically responsible for applying. Like the courts, they cannot be treated as parties with an interest in a dispute. R versus Conway, 2010, Supreme Court of Canada said, we do not have one charter for the courts and another for administrative tribunals. The jurisprudential evolution has resulted in this court's acceptance not only of the proposition that expert tribunals should play a primary role in the determination of charter issues falling within their specialized jurisdiction, but also that in exercising their statutory discretion, they must comply with the Charter. Now, here's the problem with this that probably nobody knows, because as I pointed out to Chair Pringle at the police board last uh, couple weeks ago, who actually reads this stuff, right? So this is from your own bylaw here at the City of Toronto. Bylaw 799. Neither a screening officer nor a hearing officer has jurisdiction to consider questions relating to the validity of a statute, regulation, or bylaw, or, this is the best part, the constitutional applicability or operability of any statute, regulation, or bylaw. R versus Conway again in 2010 says, this truism is reflected in the court's recognition that the principles <clears throat> governing remedial jurisdiction under the Charter apply both to courts and administrative tribunals. It is also reflected in the jurisprudence flowing from Mills and the Kadichik's trilogy, according to which, with rare exceptions, administrative tribunals with the authority to apply the law have the jurisdiction to apply the Charter to the issues that arise in the proper exercise of their statutory functions. And I'll just read over your own bylaw again, 799, what it says. Neither a screening officer nor a hearing officer has jurisdiction to consider questions relating to the validity of a statute, regulation, or bylaw, or the, or the constitutional applicability or operil, operability of any statute, regulation, or bylaw. So it seems, even though the Supreme Court has said one thing, it's like, eh, we're the city of Toronto. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to follow the law. The laws don't apply to us. But now, thanks to me, you all know differently because I did a Freedom of Information Act request and I found out 
that your director of prosecutions over there, Kelly Chapman, is a screening officer. So on the off chance that I get her as my screening officer in the future, I wonder what will happen. Will she have the nerve to say to me, Derek, well, I law 799 says that uh, you know, we can't uh, deal with the constitutional applicability. Because now she knows differently, in the future, if someone comes and deals with her, she knows what the Supreme Court of Canada has said. Because as we all know, uh, we even have a police chief now that uh, got caught by the Superior Court of Ontario not wanting to follow the Constitution. So it's no surprise that the City of Toronto doesn't want to follow the Constitution either. So I just, this is a letter from uh, Chief Justice Heather Smith that I got recently. And it says that uh, judges of the Superior Court of Justice in Ontario swear an oath of allegiance. Actually, it's from her executive legal officer. The wording of which is set out in both Section 4 of the Public Officers Act and Section 2.1 of the Federal Oaths, Act, Oaths of Allegiance Act. Uh, I guess it's federal. And both statutes are publicly available. Yours truly, Mohan Sharma, executive legal officer. So I'm sure everyone took their oath, the other queen. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Questions of the deputy? No questions. You got away free. That's a shock. <laughs> Have a great day, Derek. You too. Thank you. Uh, questions of staff? Musical interlude time again. Councillor Davis. So, one of the things that I saw in, who's answering questions? Oh. It's always awkward talking with my back to people. Um, so the changes that we're, we're negotiating, l let me just, we, we think that the new processes that are being proposed under the bill, Bill 177, um, they will give us, um, there's a list on page three, early resolution meetings, ex allowing the clerk to provide extensions of time, Etc. These changes, um, those are the essential changes that we think um, we're seeking, or those changes, changes that are already permitted. I know we have to negotiate some things with the provincial government. So at the top of page three, there are mm -hmm. uh, five bullet points, mm -hmm. and um, of the five, uh, four of them are already legislated. Changes okay. that were included in Bill 177. Well, they're all included in 177. The one that needs to be uh, discussed further with the province and then brought back to council would be the fourth bullet point about entering into agreement to transfer the responsibility of additional prosecutions under the Provincial Fences Act. Okay. It's part three prosecutions. Okay, okay, the part three offenses. So this is kind of a good news, uh, but be wary uh, report. I think it's a good news, but be wary of the transfer of part three prosecutions comes with a price tag. Exactly, so what I'm trying to understand is, uh, because it says that um, taking on this responsibility, they'd be fully downloading <laughs> again, even more to us. Um, the part three prosecutions um, is, could potentially cost us millions of dollars in staffing and training um, with some risk associated with what the revenues would be. Is that, if I got that right? I'm not sure what you're asking about with the revenues. The city already receives the revenues from all of the part three prosecutions. Um, the city is under the current MOU paying to the province the costs of its prosecutors, but at a rate that um, we understand does not reflect the true cost. What? They're charging us too much? Or they're charging us too little? They're charging us much less than what the costs are right now. Oh, and they are charging us too And little. they've put us on notice that those are being reviewed at the same time they're reviewing their... Uh, other possibility of transferring the responsibility to municipalities. These are discussions that are happening across Ontario right now, and the uh, information we have from the provinces is that they're very motivated to transfer these responsibilities to municipalities. So are th would they then transfer, uh, they would transfer additional costs for sure then? 
the costs are borne currently by the municipalities, but we are in essence being subsidized by the province because they aren't charging us the full rate. Um, one of the options open to the province is to increase those rates. We've seen that happen already with the cost of the judiciary and under the current agreement that they can raise those costs within, without any consultation with us. Is there not some way to just say, keep it? <laughs> like, I, I, we've just watched over the years <coughs> as the costs um, have not been, that, that we've had to bear far more costs than we had in the past. So are you saying that, what, what is your advice at this point? It's not clear to me. It's very early days with the legislation just passing for us to provide fulsome advice. We wanted to give uh, this committee and council the uh, heads up that this is coming and we're working towards it. We expect to bring a fulsome report forward on what the implications will be. While there's additional cost to be borne if we enter, if we enter into a, a agreement with the province uh, to assume responsibilities for prosecutions of part threes, there are so additional tools within the changes of the Provincial Offences Act that will transform and modernize the service of the public and should improve both revenues and uh, have some cost savings. But the overall bottom line is not known at this time since we're still undergoing the analysis. Yeah, but taking on the part three prosecutions aren't um, mandatory. No, that would it's be discretionary. So we could still make use of the additional tools without taking on the part three prosecutions. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Uh, it would require the province to reopen the memorandum of understanding with the city and provide notice to the city they intend to do so. Uh, but they have uh, made it known to us that uh, they also would be looking at increasing the amount that they charge unilaterally to the municipalities for the cost of the part threes. Um, so I suppose what we're still reviewing now is if they increase the cost to the municipalities unilaterally uh, or we take over the responsibility, what do we get the best bang for the taxpayer's dollar? So how well, surely we, do we, we can't make Last that. question, Councillor. Surely we can't make that decision, though, until they are clear what they're going to charge. That's correct. That's what we're looking at now. And I thought they reduced the, the uh, cost to some of the municipalities because there was a great burden that many municipalities couldn't absorb. There's been no cost reduction to municipalities on the Provincial Offences Act programs. Okay. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Other questions on this item? Seeing none, speakers? Councillor Davis? Did you want to speak or move the recommendations? Um, or both? Okay, I will move the recommendations, which is just to receive the report for information. Um, even though it's a report for action, <laughs> it really is take no action. This is a holding brief, I guess, to say um, the changes to the legislation could give us more authority, uh, new tools and more authority um, and on the part three prosecutions, but I think uh, we don't have enough information quite yet about how they're going to proceed. And uh, with a new government, um, who knows how long uh, or if they're going to be making these changes at all, I guess. So, um, anyway, thank you for the information. It was um, useful to know uh, that these changes are pending. Thank you. Okay. On item number 14, Councillor Davis is moving the recommendation, which is to receive this report for information. All in favor? Carried. Our next item is number 15, 250 year old oak tree at 76 Coral Gable Drive. We have two deputants. The first one is Mr. Trevor Comer. Comer. <clears throat> Good morning, sir. You have five minutes to begin whenever you're ready. Hello. 
My name is Trevor Coomer. I am a volunteer with the Police Liaison Committee of 12 Division and Toronto Police Services. I have many volunteer roles in the West End community and one of them happens to be 12 Division's Master Carpenter slash Wood Carver. In January 2017, I was given a history tour by fellow CPLC member Edith George of her neighborhood. I went to see the Red Oak at 76 Coral Gable Drive. It was a cold, wet day, but when I got out of my truck and looked up to this massive tree, I was instantly transported back to my youth. The kid in me said, how will I ever climb this one? The size of this tree made me feel small again, humbled, bringing back all those summer memories of lying in the grass, looking up through the leaves to catch dancing patterns of blue sky. Then Edith took me to see its sister tree, located on the ridge of the Humber at 157 St. Lucie Drive. Still overcast and windy, I stood staring at the skeletal remains of what once must have been another massive tree. The St. Lucie Drive tree was deemed a hazard tree by the Forestry Department, and its canopy was cut down on Friday, August 12, 2016. I went from warm and fuzzy memories of my youth to a stark cold reality. The wind making my eyes water. Yeah, that was it, the wind. I knew I had to do something with this tree. So what to do with this wood? The CPLC and the community got together and made this our 150 project. We got volunteers from Davy Tree to safely fell its 16 foot circumference trunk so I could move the thousands of pounds of wood. We are now in the process of carving various works of art to be distributed to public places in our community. I have, been also, I have also been in discussion with the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations regarding offering their community wood to carve. These trees will live on as art forms. The difference between this tree and the coral gable red oak of GM 29.15 is that it was never maintained in its lifetime, but the coral gable red oak had constant care from 1961 to April 2015. The previous owners had a love and respect for this tree and had a sense of duty to care for it. I have worked with and seen many trees in my lifetime, and yes, have climbed a few too but I have never seen a tree that compares to this red oak. It's the stuff childhood dreams are made of and a hearkening back for us older kids. I am hoping that the Government Management Committee will understand that Toronto does not have a built history, but a natural history and heritage as well. It is easy, it is easy to take our natural history for granted. It, it's always been there and overlooked. It's too, till it's too late, or it's gone. Tell the story of the Coral Gable Red Oak and what history it has stood witness to. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in this morning. Uh, next, I have Ms. Alice Castleman from the Association for Canadian Educational Resources. Good morning, you have five minutes to begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair and uh, GMC Committee, for this opportunity. My name is Alice Castleman. I'm the founding president of ACER, which is also Latin for Maple, Association for Canadian Educational Resources, which I established in 1981. ACER's focus is building an army of citizen scientists to monitor changes in our environment, especially trees, and to collect relevant, compatible, and cumulative data to share. Our programs train communities to plant, to measure and to maintain trees and to share data. Our clients include school boards, conservation authorities, and all levels of government. ACER programs are funded by municipal, provincial, and federal governments, agencies, and foundations. We are now working with Toronto Parks and Trees Foundation and their community partners to plant trees or shrubs in sacred green spaces in low canopy areas. 
in Toronto. I'm here today to support the city's initiative to provide 50% funding to add the 250-year-old Red Oak at 76 Coral Gable Drive to Toronto's natural and cultural heritage. On September 24, 2015, we sent a letter in response to MM91.1 to protect the Red Oak in question. Included in the letter were measurements and carbon sequestration calculations. In this letter, Acer also recommended purchase and propagation of this tree since it's not hybridized and has genes that allowed it to adapt over 250 years of change. A trained citizen science program was also recommended to help carry out city tree inventories. Measured in 2006 of the height of 77, 75 feet, the circumference of the red oak in question was 16.4 feet, about five meters around, with a diameter of 5.2 feet or about 160 centimeters. Now, for some of you who remember your height in centimeters, I imagine if you were laid across a diameter of a cut tree, you would probably just fit. Since carbon makes up 50% of the dry weight biome or biomass of the tree, it was calculated to hold 11.5 tons of carbon stored in wood above ground in 2006. If this wood were burned, 45 tons of carbon dioxide would be released. If it's still held in carvings, it's held in carvings. I.e., that is to generate electricity burning wood at 34% efficiency, it would be 0.39 kilograms per kilowatt hour versus natural gas at 0.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. Just an idea. Note that this red oak has grown and stored wood both above ground and below ground for 12 more years since these measurements were taken. In closing, it's better to keep the tree living and locking up carbon and wood from the carbon dioxide being produced daily in our city and be a part of Toronto's natural cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castleman. Are there any questions for the deputant? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Appreciate all the feedback and your comments. Are there any questions of staff on this item? Yeah. Councillor Corsanti. Chair, to the appropriate staff. So it says the recommendations uh, uh, say that uh, uh, recommendation one that council authorize the deputy city manager to negotiate the acquisition of 76 Coral Gable Drive. So uh, clearly, has there been any communication with the current owner? So the current owners. I'm sorry, Ms. Castleman, you can sit down if you like. Interesting. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Crisanti. No problem. So we talked to the current owner. Oh, there, there you are. Uh, uh, through the chair, there have been some conversations with the current owner. We obtained his permission to do a, a scan of the, an ultrasound of the tree to determine its health. Uh, and we did find out from him uh, what his asking uh, price and terms were. And that's the extent of the conversations we've had to date. So beyond that, you don't really know if there's a willingness to enter into an agreement? I would say there's a willingness to have a discussion. Tim can speak to. Okay, uh, and through the chair, this is uh, real estate. Will now take the, the ball, I guess the ball here now from the uh, Office of Partnerships and Forestry and start the discussions with the homeowner uh, to see if we can come to terms and negotiate uh, an offer to sell. Right. So the other part of the uh, the recommendations also suggests that fifty percent of the funds should come from. Uh, um, uh, funded from a private donation or, or, or from the public. So in negotiating uh, with the owner, is the city gonna bridge fine? I mean, how do you enter into a, uh, an agreement when you don't have all the money in place? You That's, gotta fundraise. That, that, is, that is part of our challenge, but that has gotta be part of what the negotiation is. So the. Office of Partnerships and in collaboration with uh, the Partnerships Unit at Parks, Forestry and Recreation has been in touch with the um, Parks and Trees Foundation to initiate a fundraising uh, campaign, which we will do simultaneously to the discussions and the negotiations that real estate is, uh, is conducting. 
Um, we don't yet have a target. It's our preference that we wait for that, but Council has expressed a number of times their interest in seeing us get underway with fundraising, so that's what we'll do. All right, but we need to have an agreement with the owner indicating that he is 100% interested in selling at an agreed price uh, with maybe a due diligence period to raise X number of dollars over whatever 90 days before you or, or six months or whatever time you you both agree is an appropriate time to raise the funds through through the chair yeah that's correct councillor we would we would negotiate those terms uh, the amount that uh, that we would purchase the property for due diligence period closing date all right and and if you, if if uh, I guess if you fall short you continue to negotiate extensions until such time that we reach that goal uh, we would attempt to do that, but ultimately we'd have to have the uh, cooperation of the property owner as well to continue with the extensions. All right. No, I'm just, I guess I'm just concerned that if in 90 days, uh, well, I don't know what the value of this property is, but if it's, uh, you know, if we have to raise, uh, I don't know, a million bucks privately uh, and, and uh, we reach our due, our, 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 our due diligence uh, or period expires and the owner changes his mind, so then at that point, all the money gets refunded to all the different people who contributed their or who donated their portion. Okay. Have well, you it, thought, it, thought about it that far down the road, or in, in terms of the negotiation, uh, as we haven't started that yet, uh, I think what we would probably be proposing is a six-month period to try and uh, get to the point of getting those funds raised, and then once we have that, then all the due diligence periods and such would kick in. But again, that would all be subject to the owner's uh, agreement in that. In terms of the money collected through donations, I'm going to let uh, partnership office speak to that. So through the chair, that, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, when, uh, when donations are, are made and tax receipts are issued, we actually aren't able to return the funds. It's one of the regulations mm. provided by uh, Canada Revenue. So uh, we certainly hope that we are able to raise the adequate amount of dollars for this whole uh, negotiation to uh, proceed successfully. Uh, it depends on many different factors, including the willingness of the, uh, of the homeowner. But in the event that we lose the uh, willingness of the homeowner and we don't uh, raise the adequate amount of funds, uh, we would have to look at the ability to spend those funds on something similar. So people having given money uh, for a particular heritage tree would be expecting that the funds would be raised on on some aspect of, of that purpose of the, that which the funds were given. Because as I said, we're not able to return the money. Right. So I would think transparency here is critical that we uh, uh, let our the, the people who do contribute uh, can fully understand that the likelihood is, is, is good that we'll raise the money we need. However, um, it, it, it's not refundable if, if, uh, if this deal falls through for whatever reason, but the money will be redirected to another cause equally as good. That's the question, Councillor? That, yes, it, through you. the Chair, that's correct. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor? Thanks, Mr. Chair. In terms of the fundraising strategy, would that also include the operating maintenance uh, cost of the tree? Uh, I believe through the chair, the way the recommendation is worded, uh, the fundraising is to go towards half the uh, market value of the uh, property being acquired. So the operation and maintenance fee would be above and beyond that. It would be, sorry? Above and beyond that. So we would absorb? We would absorb that. And Parks, Forestry and Recreation has looked at that and provided those figures. Okay, and then my second question, in terms of the fun, fundraising, uh, would that continue for all heritage, all heritage? Um, so, uh, through the chair, the, uh, the focus of the fundraising is for the purchase of this particular heritage tree and this one only. But will we consider this strategy for any other heritage sites? Through the chair, uh, at this point in time, it's not going to be considered as a strategy for raising funding. Thank you.
Other questions of staff on this? Seeing none, speakers? No speakers? All right, so somebody want to move the recommendations in the report? <clears throat> Councillor Crisanti, you're moving the recommendations in the report. All in favor? Carry. Uh, we're now in number 24, the Northwest Path Extension, Union Station of Wellington Street, Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Addendum for Schedule C. Uh, one of our speakers has withdrawn their name, Janice Solomon. So the first speaker is Brody Johnson from the Toronto Financial District Business Improvement Area. Is Brody Johnson here. Mr. Johnson, you have five minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this item. My name is Brody Johnson and I'm the Planning and Advocacy Manager for the Financial District BIA. I'm here today to state that our organization supports the Northwest Path Extension Alignment Number 4 as recommended in the staff report. The Financial District BIA is critically invested in improving access to our area and supporting transportation and movement within. The PATH Network is a critical piece of pedestrian infrastructure in this city, helping to reduce congestion while supporting the broader pedestrian network. The climate controlled environment not only provides relief from, from weather during our winters, but also relief from heat wave temperatures like we saw this past weekend. The PATH is the primary pedestrian network supporting Canada's largest employment hub of more than 200,000 workers, and as noted in the TO Core Downtown Secondary Plan, in the past 15 years, the population living within the PATH has increased by over 250%. As Union Station is the city's busiest transportation hub and sees greater and greater population use, it will only continue to grow further with planned expansion of GO Regional Express Rail Network, Smart Track, and completion of waterfront transit connections. It is vital that we have and improve these underground connections. The PATH network is also a significant economic driver and major business attraction that differentiates Toronto from other financial cores around the world. Connecting more than 80 buildings and including 1,100 retail fronts, the PATH generates 1.7 billion in sales revenue each year. The Financial District BIA recognizes the importance, the economic importance, and has significantly invested in partnership with the city to improve the pathway funding across the entire network. We would like to thank the city and its consultant team for being involved in a rigorous and robust process and feel the recommended alignment number four is the best balance of cost and feasibility in meeting current and future pedestrian demand in the core. In using the existing underground structure, it minimizes construction related traffic impacts on downtown streets and provides excellent access to jobs in the core. It will also reduce congestion on the existing path network by providing another access point to Union Station. Moving forward, it is important for all of us to, to ensure the required capital funding is in place to see this project is completed in an expedited fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, questions of the deputy? Seeing none, thank you for coming in this morning and also uh, for all the work you do on behalf of your BIA. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Terry Flynn and Deb Burling, Bentel Kennedy for the Canadian Limited Partnership, or Bentel Kennedy Canada Limited Partnership. I think I'm missing a comma in there somewhere. Good morning, you have uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. My name is Deb Burling, I'm with Bentel Kennedy. Um, we are the property managers of 55 University. Um, this path is very imperative for us. Um, it would bring traffic flow from the Union Station up through the core into the other properties currently as an individual who just recently come down to the downtown core is very disjointed when you come from out of the GO station or the subway and you then have to come up to the street level and then find the path to go down. This way it'll be a smooth transition when you come off the GO and subways right straight up to, to the um, existing buildings as well to generate employment while the union, while the uh, path is being constructed as well for the um, businesses that would be implemented into the path when that is constructed. As well, it would relieve the congestion of pedestrians at the Union and uh, at University and Front Avenue. If you're going out at five o'clock in the evening and there's an event going on in that intersection, it's brutal trying to get across the street. 
also the congestion for the vehicles trying to cross with all the pedestrians going. It's an insane area to um, be at at that time of the evening. This way, it would bring everybody down to the underneath. Then everybody would have a smooth transition through the um, path. People who are parking for events can go underground. That would relieve the congestion. Many nights they have to have police on, escort up there to get the traffic flow moving. This would um, be a smooth transition for that as well. Um, it would also bring the people under the core to implement for the uh, businesses. It would bring um, uh, people into buying and uh, generate business and employment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Really appreciate your feedback. Uh, are there any questions of staff on this item? Councillor Davis. So um, the alignment number four, who am I speaking to? Ask. Alignment number four um, that you're recommending it's going to require an additional 38.242 million in capital costs. Through, through the chair, uh, we actually have uh, money in our budget. What we're looking for is we're looking for the ability to remove the cap with Metrolink's cost share. There's an agreement in place, a 2008 agreement, that Metrolink's will cost share on the construction of the Northwest Path. Right. So, and we, we have put money in our capital budget in anticipation of the Northwest Path going forward, so we do have funding. Oh, I thought I read that there's an incremental capital requirement of 38.2 million. That's correct. Just so that was my chair. question. Okay. Sorry, I'll just. There's 50, 87 in total. Currently we have 49 million and we need 38. Through, just through the chair, if I if I just I want I just I'll uh, just clarify a little bit more. We actually have the 50 million in the budget. To your point, Councillor, the the requirement is just close to 88 million. And what uh, what Denise is referring to is an agreement with Metrolinx that we're going to be asking them to no. share the 88. We have not. We have. Uh, we'll be putting that forward to. No, I I understand okay. that. It, but it is incremental. You're right. I'm just trying to establish. We Absolutely. need 38 million more. It is. Okay. And. Um, Toronto Parking Authority is saying they're going to lose uh, one and a half million in revenues, uh, and 85% uh, of that would be revenues to the city. So, in some ways, we should be costing, expecting that loss in revenue to the city from from the TPA. So, um, that would be close to another million. Um, and that, the, but you go on to say that the reduced revenues will be uh, re offset by advertising and 3,600 square feet of retail space. Correct. So this is going to be a commercial, there's going to be retail all through it and advertising? It, it would be, it would form part of the path system, which is typical that we have retail and advertising. Mm -hmm. And so you're s suggesting it's, there's 3,600 square feet of, I guess that's not a whole lot, of retail. These are kiosks or? Sorry, if you go to page 21 of the report, it shows you in plan form the retail locations. Okay. Page 21 doesn't really show me anything. <laughs> oh, sorry, attachment two. Yeah, the trouble is it's reproduced in black and white. I can't have a clue. That's right. It still doesn't help. I still can't read that. <laughs> Who could read that? Ms. What does it can't. say? There's four? I, I, I can't tell. How, what kind of retail is in this pathway? We actually have some larger drawings that we'll uh, present to you. So are those lines along the way stores? That, that's correct. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, possibly fifteen. 
stores? Oops. They would be small, typical stores that you'd find in the pass system. If you take the path from St. Andrew's Station east, it, it would be typical of that type of retail. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But that's not going to make up. Thank you. Oh, there they are. Bigger. Why do we have to commercialize everything? <laughs> we're hoping to get from Metrolink. So how, if we don't, when will we know whether we'll have additional funding from Metrolink? Uh, Councillor Davis, what the report asks for is approval of alignment four through the EA process and that we want to report back next year on the outcome the case. of our negotiations both with Metrolink and with the various property owners. We're approving the route in advance of knowing whether we can finance it. Okay, thank you. Other questions of staff on this item? Councillor Tracy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, you explored several routes. Uh, I know this wasn't the least expensive, but can you explain why and what, what the benefits are to this route? Sorry, do you want to resort? Oh, okay. Um, what we did was we looked at, through the EA process, we looked at four possible routes. Then through the EA process, there's a criteria that everything is evaluated, and it was through that criteria that this option was selected. This option was selected because it did provide, in pedestrian flow terms, it was the most desirable direction to go in. The idea that we could add retail was also a benefit because it means that it's not an empty space, there's activity in it. And when you do the pedestrian modeling, these long uh, corridors with no, uh, um, no other uh, sort of activity going on as in retail or anything, they tend to be less used. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions of staff? Seeing none, speakers? Councillor Choisey? I'd like to move the staff recommendations to approve alignment four and to report back on a business case for funding the project. The Northwest Pass was identified as a necessary extension to manage pedestrian congestion to Union Station when the revitalization project was begun. Now that staff have taken a step back to refine the rec recommended route, we need to move ahead to get this important connection built. Fortunately, the additional review has given us an option with improved benefits. The retail opportunities along the university alignment will provide better animation of the connection along with increased revenue for the city. With this alignment, staff now have the basis to engage partners such as Metrolinx to create the business case and cost sharing that will deliver the infrastructure needed to move more people through Canada's busiest transit hub. So I want to thank the city staff because I know they've had an extensive analysis and consultation process and the contributions of the financial district and the entertainment district BIAs uh, in all these discussions. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Other comments on this? Seeing none, um, I'll be supporting the recommendations as well. I'm, uh, as somebody that takes the GO train in each and every day to get to City Hall uh, in the inclement weather in particular, I'm very happy we have a, a path system. I can think back to when I was a teenager when we had a very small uh, path system uh, underground. Now you can go from basically harbour front, I think you can go all the way to the Eaton Centre through part of our path system. I'm glad to see that it continues to expand. I think this is an excellent connection uh, as well for Union Station as uh, one of the other reports, uh, our progress report on Union Station and all the work we're doing there to make sure it's well connected uh, into the, not only the business community and the office towers uh, downtown, but making sure we get people from point A to point B. And um, I think this will be a very welcome addition to the system and I'm glad to see it's moving forward. <coughs> all right, all in favor? Opposed? All right, so that's unanimous. Uh, our next item is number 30, Fair Wage Policy Non-Compliance, Aloi Brothers Concrete Contractors Limited. 
I have one deputy in Pina Aloi from Aloi Brothers Concrete Contractors Limited. It's Ms. Aloi, are you? Good morning. Good morning. You have five minutes uh, to make your presentation whenever you're ready. Uh, there's a button speaker in front of you. When the button's lit up, your microphone is on, and you can start whenever you're ready. And my name is Pina Aloya, and I'm here with Ely Scarlett, which I have asked to speak on our behalf in this matter. Okay. Good morning, Chair, members of Council. Thank you for providing us with the opportunity to speak to this matter today. Um, this is a matter related to a fair wage office um, determination of non-compliance. I'm not going to go behind that. What I am going to do is spend a little bit of time providing you with a little bit of history of Aloya's record as a city contractor. Aloya has pre-amalgamation and post-amalgamation done a lot of work for the City of Toronto. This is the first and only issue that has come up with respect to Aloya and the Fair Wage Office. What I understand is, is that monies have been withheld and have been withheld since 2014. That's almost four years. Um, this matters uh, not one where a lawyer is receiving the benefit of interest on these monies and there's a recommendation in the report of the manager for the fair wage office that the monies be released subject to some terms and conditions. So I'd like to speak to the terms and conditions that the recommendations are speaking to to provide an alternative for this, for the possibility of this to be resolved on a, on a full and final basis today. Um, the Fair Wage Office has a mandate. It's understood. Um, as a lawyer, as a contractor, when it makes a request for proposal, has to confirm in part of that contract that it will comply with the Fair Wage policy. And over the course of its history doing work, which is almost in excess of 20 years for the City of Toronto, um, it, it hasn't had any record of non-compliance with fair wage policies. We have no complaint from any particular contractor or subcontractor or individual that says a lawyer has failed to comply with fair wage. Fair wage has requested that these monies be withheld and subject to some conditions. So one is an administrative penalty. The other is disqualification as a contractor, and the other is proof that subcontractors have been paid as per invoice. Now, what I understand is if we could deal with the matters from the perspective of that these monies have been withheld and not available to a family-run business that is a small, privately-owned family-run business that is a non-union um, business. That is something that has to be considered in the fair wage policy as well when considering what is available. I'm also concerned that there's no interest that's accrued for the benefit of a lawyer, even though it hasn't had the money that is due and owing to it for work that has actually been performed, that the city has received the benefit of, and on a quantum merit basis, a lawyer is owed a significant amount of money. That has financial impact on a lawyer. While the manager's report says it has no financial impact on the city whatsoever. I think that is an important consideration. In the period of time that a lawyer has not received the benefit of this funds, it has also not done any work for the city of Toronto. It has not bid on any contracts and it has not um, had any further complaints. So um, this is a matter for $119,000 to be paid out. The recommendations of the Fair Wage Office, as I've reviewed them in the report, suggest that they should be subject to an administrative fee of 15%. I submit with respect that that may be um, slightly draconian for a lawyer in the circumstances since it hasn't had the benefit of those monies for four years and really the dispute is over a gap in information. Um, the recommendations of the manager of the Fair Wage Office says upon proof that a lawyer has paid all of its subcontractors, 
Aloya's presidents prepared to swear a statutory declaration for the purposes of indicating that all the subcontractors have been paid. There is a small amount that's owed to FERPAC construction, and that has, um, for Aloya's even prepared to undertake to ensure that amount is paid from those funds, or alternatively go with the recommendation that it be paid directly from those funds. And so the two issues that really for this committee today from the perspective of Aloya are payout, when it can be paid out, minimizing the penalties because the penalties have been somewhat already felt by Aloya. Um, and if disqualification is the recommendation, I say that this is a first offense. They've had a good record. I think that should a, a lawyer make um, bids based on requests for proposals from the city that are successful bids, um, then perhaps the probationary period could uh, be used rather than the more um, serious consequence of being disqualified from being on the bidders list. And certainly, since they haven't done any work in four years for the city of Toronto, disqualification at this point has little impact on Aloya other than to damage its reputation, um, which I don't think is a fair thing for Aloya when the Fair Wage Office and Aloya have a dispute as to this quantity and sufficiency of information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions of the deputy? Councillor Crisanti. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I have a couple of questions and thank you for coming in. And I, um, um, just a couple of things that you, you said. First of all, I just wanna uh, reiterate, how long has Aloya been doing business with the city? Um, What's the relationship there? Well, pre-amalgamation, it was doing work for various municipalities, East York, Etobicoke, et cetera. Post-amalgamation, pretty much since. Okay. And you indicated that, you know, at, at no time other than this time that we have in front of us uh, that there have been issues with the fair wage office in the past? No prior fair wage issues. In fact, it is, it is um, a, a proponent and a supporter of fair wage for all its employees and its subcontractors. So I'm going to be asking staff the same question too, but it seems excessive that we're holding your deposits for four years now. Why do you think that's happening? Well, there's a dispute between the Fair Wage Office and um, there's a gap in information. A lawyer can't provide the further information the Fair Wage Office required, and they haven't provided a great deal of guidance on what that is, other than it doesn't match the city uh, North York Tra Transportation Division's records, and so therefore there's a, there's a discrepancy in information. But that discrepancy can't be explained by a lawyer's records. They've provided everything. They've opened their books. They've made it transparent. They've given payroll records. They provided affidavits. They, you know, they provided everything they could possibly provide based on their records and based on the policy, they've complied, they've cooperated. And, and what, can you tell me a bit about that discrepancy? Is, is the discrepancy with respect to how uh, the amount they're being paid, that they're not being paid as per the fair wage? No, actually, it seems to be a discrepancy over how many people were noted on site by a North York inspector on particular days versus the records that Aloya has for its employees. I don't know, this was a manual head count of an inspector over four years ago. I don't know whether it was accurate, but that's the basis. And it was that that triggered the fair wage office to start this process, which Aloya has cooperated in. Um, however, there is no actual complaint. So they have been paying fair wages in terms of the hourly rate. They have been complying with the number of hours. The discrepancy is with respect to a head count. So uh, a head count meaning what? Just uh, meaning that not agreeing the, on the number of people on the job? Well, no. The in, the, the city's records suggested so many people were on site on a certain day when Aloya's right. records and the subcontractor's records don't actually show that. And so, uh, you know, but Aloya got 
had several of its employees swear affidavits about the wages, when they were on site, what they did, the hours they worked, and this was still insufficient to the Fair Wage Office. And you said something about FERPAC, it still owed some money? FERPAC was one of the contractors that apparently was involved as a subcontractor to Aloya. Mm -hmm. um, they were somehow, uh, they delivered up their records, were found to have been compliant, but they weren't paid in full by Aloya because apparently there was some dispute between the Fair Wage Office as to whether it was FERPAC or one of the other subcontractors. Um, as I understand it, FERPAC and Aloya have been in touch with each other and they've agreed and Aloya has assured me that they will be paid from the funds released um, and they will give an undertaking to council if you want something in writing, we're happy to provide it, that those funds will be paid from the funds earmarked if released to a lawyer. Okay, um, one final question, I'm running out of time. So you, you said something about um, uh, you have not done work for the City of Toronto now for four years? A lawyer has not done work for the City of Toronto. So no new work, okay. Um, it has effectively suffered the penalty that the Fair Wage Office is seeking to, to implement continue. now. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grisanti. Are there questions of staff? Or sorry, question of the deputant, seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions thank of staff? You. Are there any questions of staff? That's why I'm asking. Yes, okay. Councillor Grisanti. So then to staff, I, I, I just read it. So I, I think this, is, uh, you know, this has been before us before. Uh, so I, I'd like to understand, you know, um, so what happened since then till now? Um, well, let's start with that. So <clears throat> through the chair, uh, there have been uh, ongoing discussions between the Fair Wage Office <clears throat> and Alloy Brothers to try and determine the information required. Uh, there was a meeting in January of this year and no further information was brought forward by the company. Okay, so how long has it been since it was last before us? It was in November of 2017. Uh, has there been communication? Has there been any discussion uh, since then? Yes, there was a meeting in January of 2018 between the parties. All right, you know, I just heard the deputants say too this morning that they, they did disclose all the information they had. Was there, so are you missing information? So the discrepancy is that uh, transportation records show that there were more workers on site than what has been provided by the company. And without having full disclosure of how many people were there and knowing what the payroll implications were, we don't have a full picture to determine whether or not there was a violation of the fair wage policy. So that discrepancy still exists. Okay, that, that part I'm not clear on. So uh, transportation records show there are more people on site. Uh, give me an example of that. The so uh, without using the exact number, uh, transportation may have indicated there were 25 people on site and the payroll records would indicate there were none in some instances or that there were a fewer number than, than that. Uh, is this documented that these people were on site and you've been able to demonstrate that to a lawyer? Uh, uh, yes, we have. Transportation has those records and I believe they were provided to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. the last night. So, so are these are people that are supposed to be working on site? Uh, I'll ask my transportation colleagues to respond to that. So um, we have photographs of um, 
Aloy are working on site where comparing the notes, the numbers that they gave to fair wage, they indicated they had less. We've uh, also compared <coughs> progress payments to show how the volume of work and production that they had done had increased, and again, their numbers were really low as far as employees. Uh, I'm sorry, are you saying then that employees were on site but they were not being paid? Not, not, as, no, employees were on site where they indicated the fair wage when they submitted their payroll that they had no employees working that day. We have photographs of, um, of them actually working. Okay. And, um, and you, have you had this discussion with a lawyer too? Yes. Okay. And, and the response was? We haven't come to an agreement. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't hear that. We're here today. They just. Oh, okay. And um, and they have not done any work. Uh, how long have, has it been since the last contract with the city of Toronto? I would not know that. That's. I was know. one of the three inspectors that were assigned right. to this contract. And so none of the deposit is any of the deposit uh, being released, or is it still all? The 120,000 still on hold. The, we still have uh, the hold back, and the report is suggesting some of the release of that. So you're in a position to release some of it now? Yes, and our recommendation is that there should be an administrative fee given the amount of time that uh, the Fair Wage Office has had to um, deal with this issue, as well, <clears throat> as, well as recommending that uh, fur back be repaid, which the company has indicated they will be doing, which is good. All right. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Other speakers on this? Councillor Davis? I'll move the staff recommendations. Okay. Other speakers? I'm just concerned. I guess this has been going on for quite some time. Um, and, I, you know, I know that we need to uh, you know, uphold our, our fair wage policy, and, and, and it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not pleased that things have not come to a successful resolution. Uh, it looks like, in, in part, maybe uh, there's been some agreement where now uh, staff is in a position to release some of the uh, some of the funds. Um, they haven't done any business with the city for four years. I'm not sure if the two-year disqualification. Is, is even applicable, they, I, th I think, in essence, been disqualified for four years. So, um, and, and one question I, I forgot to ask was, this disqualification, is this retroactive to a certain date, or is this starting at a future date? Can I get clarity on that? Speaking. No, Mr. Chair, I can't Speaking. get clarity on that. Speaking. Right. <clears throat> anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other speakers? Seeing none, so I'm supporting the, the recommendations in the staff report. Um, I've echoed this before at this committee. Um, we've had a fair wage office that's been in existence for I think almost 125 years now. Um, it's in existence to make sure that the, the rights of workers they're non-unionized that are contractors or even subcontractors that do work in the city of Toronto um, have their rights uh, protected, that they're adequately paid, and uh, you know that's the, the whole basis of why we have the Fair Wage Office here. I want to thank staff for their continued work and diligence in ensuring that the, the parameters and the guidelines under which the Fair Wage uh, Act is applied or bylaws are applied and I'll be supporting the recommendations in the report. Thank you. So at this point, we have the report before us. Recommendations are moved. All in favor? Opposed? And that passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next item. Sorry, Carol, where's my... Thank you. We are back at, um, sorry, I, there was a request for a bio break. Councillor Crisanti, did you need a moment, a bio break? I can't, you're good, all right. Does anybody else need a bio break? All right, 
Uh, so we're on item number eight, amendment to agree with Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt, LLP, for legal services related to pensions and benefit issues. It was held by Councillor Davis. Sorry, we're on number eight. Back at number eight. Who am I asking questions of? Mike. Mike. Mike and Derek. I, I'm just shocked that we're doubling the amount that we're spending to uh, in this for, for legal services, and you know we're talking about a million bucks. And please explain to me how many hours worth of work, why so much. Um, we're dealing with five pension plan negotiations, correct? Or four? Through the chair, we, we started with five. We are looking at four merging now. Right. And uh, certainly the law firm is helping us to get everything up to date, to deal with FISCO, to deal with uh, legal representatives of the pensioners themselves. So it's, I mean, I can't speak to the legal work itself. Certainly I've got a lawyer on each side of me who can, but I, I do know that this is a major important thing and there are, my understanding, two other law firms that do this type of work. It is a skill that is in demand at this point with the number of mergers that are happening. So can you tell us what they're charging per hour? How many hours? Like, I, I, we get these reports that say, okay, they were, we had an agreement for, I forget what it was originally, yeah. and now we're adding another 450000 to it. So, through the chair, we can advise that the, the decision to retain Osler's was undertaken through a, a procurement process that resulted in are negotiating with them a blended rate that governs the performance of their work. The The retainer has actually been in effect since 2012. Mm -hmm. And so the rate that is uh, in place with them uh, is a $600 an hour rate. It, this is sophisticated legal work and you pay a premium when you go outside to have that work done and frankly with this kind of work we need to go outside. Um, so over the six years when you break down the amount that we've spent um, as over that period, it actually breaks down to approximately 125 hours a year. 125 hours a year, okay. I think I could add to that, Councillor, as well, that the, the two main lawyers involved that we've been dealing with, uh, they have between them, I think, over 50 years of experience in this area. One of them is the chair of the pension and benefits group at Osler, and the other one is a 24-year partner there who has done nothing but this work. So the, the quality of the, of the advice we're getting, I think, is, is without question. So just clarify again. They originally, we allocated 150,000. Then we added 300,000, and now we're adding another 450. Is that correct? So we're going from 150,000 nine hundred thousand dollars through the chair that is correct so right. nine hundred thousand dollars divided by six hundred dollars an hour equals 125 is it that simple uh, 125 times, four, times six six years we retained them in 2012 I don't know, every time I turn around on this agenda, there's, a, there's an increase in the amount of money we're spending on lawyers. And I thought we did do an RFP uh, in order to uh, get at certain rates and to get um, uh, So you're saying it is covered by the, so what was the retainer on this? It was 150 originally. The re I think the report itemizes that the original retainer, I think, had a uh, had a, a ter uh, an end date. Was it was it 2018, Derek? 2017? Yeah, it was 
Yeah. What, what, what happened is, is that uh, a couple of years after the retainer was entered into, the province brought forward new regulations that govern this process, and that led to a delay in terms, because we had to wait for the province to put the rules in effect. Uh, and now that they've done so, there are new rules for everybody. So we've all been looking at them and figuring out what the process is going forward. The scope of work that they've done, and my friend Mr. Brown can speak to it in more detail, I mean, they've done agreement negotiation for us. They've had to prepare notices, the new statutory notices that are required. And so there's quite a broad range of technical expertise that's been brought to bear. And I guess that's, that's been the, you know, the reasons behind the increases. I got the impression we did a lot of waiting, waiting and waiting to see what OMERS was going to do. Over several years, the updates were, we're waiting to see what OMERS is going to do. Through the chair, we have waited, but we have been preparing for this day, and we are almost there. Well, a million bucks. Well, Anyway, I know I, I'm sounding like a... Like you're at the end of your five minutes. Respect what's going... It just, it seems excessive to start at 100... Estimating the work's going to be 150, and then it's now coming in at a million virtually. I don't get it. Uh, that was your last question, Councillor. May I, Mr. Chair, through yes, you? Mr. Um, the, um, this is not a case where we get uh, occasional bills for maybe sixty, seventy thousand dollars at a time, and it simply says, "Well, we provided services worth sixty thousand. Please pay us." They've been providing um, almost monthly invoices, which I get to review, um, and they are very detailed. They 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 say how much uh, each person in question at the firm has spent on it. 0.6 of an hour here, 0.7 of an hour here, and it does add up. And I can tell you as a lawyer that I've looked at these and they are not unreasonable. It takes time to, to do research, and they did uh, two or three opinions for us, and I had to provide them with, with uh, oh, I don't know, dozens, well, maybe hundreds of old bylaws that have amended the original bylaws. Uh, to make sure that they understood what the um, uh, what the, the text of the, the pension plan said, and I know that they had to go through them, and I know that they had to review the legislation and decide who was entitled to how much surplus, or and um, and, and we needed that objective opinion so that we could go ahead and uh, uh, make the recommendations. The treasurer made a recommendation. Uh, back in, uh, when was it, August or, or October of last year, Mr. Treasurer? It was late last year. Late last year. Uh, and, and those opinions helped him recommend to council, um, well, to, to committee and then council, uh, how much um, uh, we should be willing to settle for with the pensioners. That's the surplus we're talking about. And uh, then we had to have agreements with uh, OMERS negotiated between the city and Omers, and it was the, that firm of Osler that negotiated uh, those agreements, and they had the experience to do that, uh, and the depth and, and the precedence and, and all that, which, which we simply wouldn't have in-house. We ended up at 50-50 on all of them but one. It seemed to me that's where we would have ended up. I mean, I, I don't get it. But. Well, as a matter of fact, anyway. the original there are two of the two of the pension plans said that everything goes to the city, yeah. and and uh, you know we would have ordinarily accepted that and gone on that basis and been confronted up from the other side by long arguments and perhaps a court case, whereas Osler said that's maybe what it said, but on the other hand there are arguments to the contrary, and that's why we should go for the fifty percent. So and they've been and they've been preparing documentation and I've been looking at their invoices. So this is not a, a case of a black box, where the, the the other lawyer says his wife needs another ten pairs of, of Gucci shoes. So let's soak the city the, the city for another fifty thousand. No. I want to see some evidence of that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, other questions of staff on this item. Seeing none, speakers, Councillor Davis, 
Did you want to, you held it. I don't want to move the recommendation. Somebody else can, but All right. I just think it, this seemed like an excessive bill for something that was pretty inevitable, straightforward on the facts, and that we may, I can see uh, heads shaking, but, and I'm probably uh, not well enough informed to draw that conclusion, but uh, I don't know, it's a lot of money for this set of negotiations. Okay, Councillor Tracy is moving the recommendations. All in favor? Anybody else voting? All in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, our next item is GM 29.10, mergers of the pre-OMERS pension plans with OMERS and proposal for sharing of surplus funds. Any questions of staff on this? No, I did, I did, Sorry, Councillor Crescent? No? All right. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm trying to understand why uh, the Toronto Fire Department superannuization and benefit fund plan is still out there on its own and not being administered by OMERS. It seems I'm trying to understand it. that's my first one and B, why OMERS wouldn't be administering it and we seem to be we're gonna have city staff looking after this standalone plan, what seems to be indefinitely. And, and the short answer in public is that the Toronto firefighters, pensioners, we would not pass the threshold of getting one third to, there's a negative assurance that's done with the first part as to whether there's going to be a merger. We, we ascertained we would not have gotten one third of them not responding in the negative, and I, I hate to word it that way, but that's the way the legislation is, so that we wouldn't have passed the threshold to get a merger on the fire plan, and I can certainly talk about that more if we do go in, in camera. So you can't get one third of their members to agree to it? We Actually, we would have had more than one third of their members disagreeing with a merger. How do you know that? Because we had their board, members on the board who are pensioners advised us that they would talk to their fellow members and have them not approve it. And, and certainly it, it's, a, it's a taxation issue. It is an issue that's somewhat complex that I would be more comfortable talking about in private. All right, okay. Maybe we'll go in private then at the end of the meeting. Okay, um, so I'm gonna hold this one down. So I'm gonna hold this one down. Um, so then we're on to number 21, food service opportunity at City Hall, held by Councillor Davis. Um, <laughs> the continuing saga. Um, so I just want to make sure that when you say we're going to hire an outside consultant with retail experience um, or specializes in retail and whatever, that we're not going to have a bunch of fast food takeout kiosks in our redesigned cafeteria space. So, Councillor, we would wait for the, you know, consultant's report to see what would be the feasible tenants. If you want us to, you know, narrow down their scope, you know, we can do that. But at this time, we're going to be open to whatever the consultants uh, say to city staff. Over here, this side, there, that's is, is there, I mean, I do not want it to look like a hospital main floor where there's, you know, pizza pizza and all the fast food kiosks. Um, we're not going to end up with that, right? So if I may, uh, Councillor, just, we, we had the advisory board and it says it in the report, mm -hmm. we had a panel there and the panel was very particular about what would be down there and uh, it was not fast food, they did not speak about it in that way. So they actually recommended that we would go out with a more formal uh, review with this, with the consultant and to look at things that would be a lot more um, 
more more uh, aligned to city the city city hall itself, right? So it w and fast food was not part of the discussion point. Just to give you that feedback from that from that group. Okay, so it won't be kiosks with fast food takeout. That was never the discussion with them at all. Okay. That's but we do need the consultant to come back with the report. That's all I want to know, because I know at some point there was discussion about getting rid of the seating, that um, that we would redesign the space, and that, um, I mean, the, what because of the price point, that we'd be looking at, you know, takeout um, fast food options. I know that that was discussed earlier. It, it was definitely discussed. I was actually in those discussions and the intent is to bring something that is acceptable to, to this organization. But we do need someone to go out there that has the expertise that we have, we've really worked hard with the, with the, uh, with the actual uh, panel and they've been outstanding in spending their time. We didn't even pay them for that. So they've actually recommended us to go out now to do this for the review. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Other questions on this? Yeah. Councillor Crisanti. Uh, all right, so you're seeking $100,000 to hire a consultant, uh, of which you, you've broken it down saying um, uh, 40,000 40, uh, to be spent in uh, 18. And six, why, why are you splitting it up? What are we doing for the first uh, 40? Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, the 40,000 would be for first for the consultant to provide us with the vision. And if staff are satisfied with the vision, then they would act as the city's broker and procure us a tenant. So when they procure a tenant, they're going to ask for additional fees above and beyond this total? Uh, the, that's part of it. That's, that's what we're incorporating under the 60,000. So that's under the 60, that's all included. And um, so we clearly struck out in our first round. Um, uh, it, how many uh, proponents uh, d did we have in the first round? So in the first round, we had two successful proponents, which staff uh, negotiated with, with the help of the advisory board. Yeah. We did have five or six in total, and uh, two were successful in, uh, in the response uh, with us. And then it, obviously through negotiations, it didn't pan out uh, and the work with the panel. All right, so we just couldn't come to a deal. We could not come to a deal and uh, we had to work, and we worked with uh, obviously our legal organization to, to help us through this, but uh, we just couldn't get through it, no. Okay, do we have a timeline for the, the 100,000 uh, or it, it, I guess there's no timeline, it's open whenever they can the experts, find someone. Uh, the hope is that by Q1 of 2019, counselor, that we come back with a proposal. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, other questions of staff? Seeing none, speakers? Councillor Davis, you held the item? I will move adoption of the staff recommendations. But I don't think I need to say it again. Um, that cafeteria is used as a cafeteria, not just for us, but it's used um, by everyone at the courts, they come over here. Uh, lots of people come to our uh, current cafeteria because um, the prices are reasonable and the uh, options, I think, are good. I mean, people get tired of the same things, but the prices, I think, compared to other uh, places are quite good. And, uh, and there are healthy options and the healthy options are required in the contract that we have. So whatever we do, we have to have healthy options and not fast food and seating. Because I think people do want to come down and find a place to sit. And one of the issues that was identified in this report was our inability to add space for the patio. And I think that's a reasonable request if it can be accommodated. Um, so. I don't know, I'll move the staff recommendations. I won't be here. Good luck next term on this. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just trying to work something out with staff on the previous one so we won't have to go in camera. 
Um, other speakers on this item? Nope. All right, Councillor Davis is moving the recommendations in the report. All in favor? Four. Do I need to move anything that would maybe put those conditions in it? That there be seating and that there be healthy options and not commercial takeout from fast food chains? Okay, thank you. Okay, the recommendations in the report are on the floor. All in favor? Carried. Our next item is number 23, relocation of the ML ReadyMix Concrete Batching Facility, purchase of 29 Judson Street and lease out of 545 Commissioner Street in Ward 6 and 30, uh, held by Councillor Davis. This also has an in-camera report. What's the number again? So just don't ask any questions on the purple sheets. 29. 23. So we are leasing this back to Ready Mix, is that right? I was struggling to under, really understand what this is. Um, maybe somebody will we'll really ask, quickly highlight we'll ask the staff key to elements. I know we're moving the batching plant from the uh, West End to the um, Portlands. And we're going to buy the property in uh, Etobicoke, and we're leasing the space to Ready Mix in the Portlands. Basically, that's the the deal, right? Yep. With the, and with the chair, that's correct. The one of the questions I had was how the money was going to be found. I, I sound like a right winger here today. Sure. <laughs> um, is that in, that's in camera? Yes. Can I ask it, maybe I can ask this way. What does Toronto Water have to do with this? Through the chair, Toronto Water will be relocating from 545 commissioners, a portion of that site, and they'll be relocating to their other uh, yard facilities throughout the city. because part of the property at 545 Commissioner is occupied by Toronto Water. And that portion is not going to be available to them anymore? That's correct. Because Ready Mix is going to have it? A portion of the property is going to be leased out to Ready Mix, and the other portion of the property will be still occupied by Toronto Water. Okay, that raises a question about the financing for me then. Maybe it should be in camera. You want to hold this one down? Let me hold it down and I'll run around and ask uh, in camera. You can't run around yet because the next one's number 29, integrated telecommunication infrastructure agreement well, was definitely. held by you. Well, that is definitely in camera. All right. So, so we are back to, do, 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 do. we're back to number 20. The Indian Residential School Survivors Legacy Structure. Are the deputants here? Theo, are you going first? Are you all going deputing together or? No, uh, uh, we just okay, no problem.
Morning. So you have five minutes, or sorry, you can start whenever you're ready. There's uh, usually it's five minutes per person. There's three people listed. So if you collectively wanted to do 15 minutes, okay. um, the microphone's in front of you. When the light's on in front of it, that means your microphone's on. There's a timer up on the wall there. Okay. And I'm going to start it whenever you start speaking. Right. Welcome to City Hall. Oh, I'm sorry, the other, so once you're done your presentation, uh, the committee individually, we can ask you questions for up to five minutes each. Okay. Um, then what we do is we bring it back, we ask questions of staff on this item if there are any, and then we can each speak on this item for up to five minutes. Okay. So that's kind of how it works. And whenever you're ready to start, welcome to City Hall. Sigali, my name is Leanna Kanzian, and I am the Communications and Research Coordinator at Toronto Counts Fire Native Cultural Centre at Regent Park. Uh, we're here to share a video with you on the teaching, sh learning, sharing, and healing space that's set to be completed in, um, in year 2020 in the spring. And so this is a virtual space and also as well as our promotional video for our IRSS Legacy Celebration happening in October 9 to 11 in 2018. We're just figuring out the volume. Yep, no problem. I'm just gonna, I'll start your time again whenever it's ready to go. Imagine revitalizing a great institutional space transformed to reflect the indigenous community through colorful designs, native plantings, and significant symbols of a rich culture. Further imagine places for celebrations and gatherings for individuals, families, and our survivors. Finally, contemplate a place for education and building good relations with the diverse Toronto community. To our elders who teach us of our creation and our past, so we may preserve Mother Earth for ancestors yet to come, we are the land. This is dedicated to our relatives before us thousands of years ago and to the 150 million who were exterminated across the Western Hemisphere in the first 400 years' time, starting in 1492. 
To those who have kept their homelands and to the nations extinct due to mass slaughter, slavery, deportation, and disease unknown to them, and to the ones who are subjected to the same treatment today. To the ones who survived the relocations and the ones who died along the way. To those who carried on traditions and lived strong among their people. To those who left their communities by force or by choice and for generations no longer know who they are. To those who search and never find. To those that turn away the so-called non-accepted. To those that bring us together. And to those living outside, keep in touch, the voice for many. To those that make it back to live and fight the struggles of their people. To those that give up and those who do not care. To those who abuse themselves and others. And those who revive again. To those who are physically, mentally, or spiritually incapable by accident or by birth. To those who seek strength in our spirituality and ways of life, and those who exploit it, even our own. To those who fall for the lies and join the dividing lines that keep us fighting amongst each other. To the outsiders who step in, good or bad, and those of us who don't know better. To the leaders and prisoners of war, politics, crime, race, and religion, innocent or guilty. To the young, the old, the living, and the dead. To our brothers and sisters and all living things across Mother Earth. And her beauty we've destroyed and denied the honor that the Creator has given each individual. The truth that lies in our hearts, all my relations. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, Mr. Ainley and uh, members of the Government Management uh, Committee. My name is uh, Theo Nazari, and I'm a strategic planner at Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Center. I'm here today to make this deputation not in my capacity as a strategic planner, but as a resident of the city for the past 20 years. Um, in 1997, my family and I got off a plane uh, at Pearson International and became landed immigrants. Four years later, we became citizens of this great country. I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan, and left there when I was four years old. So needless to say, this has been my home uh, for the past 20 years. I as I was growing up here in Canada, I rarely, I rarely learned about indigenous culture and history. And not only did I not learn about it, but I couldn't see it visually. Um, it wasn't until I began working at Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Center that my appreciation of the indigenous culture and history became deeper and stronger. These days, most of my time is spent working on the IRSS legacy project with this amazing team here. The project can be divided up in two parts. First and foremost, the IRSS leg legacy project is about developing the space that you've seen in the video. It's a 19 1,200 square feet of space on the southwestern corner of Nathan Phillips Square. And we are developing this space into a teaching, learning, sharing, and healing space. Secondly, the project also includes the RSS Legacy Celebration, which is a tremendous, significant cultural gathering that will bring together over 100,000 people for three days of celebrations, entertainment, and ceremonies. To first and foremost to honor residential school survivors and also to celebrate 
indigenous cultural resiliency. There are three reasons that the Government Management Committee should support this project. First, creating this space is an opportunity for the City of Toronto to become a leader and champion of reconciliation and restitution. At a time when our shared values are under scrutiny, this project provides the City of Toronto with an opportunity to become a champion and example for the rest of the country. This 19,200 square feet of space might be small, but, but it's the perfect way for the city to renew its relationship with the First Peoples of this land. It's one thing to do a land acknowledgement, as we appreciate that was done here this morning, but it's another thing to make a serious investment in the Indigenous community. Secondly, as a non-Indigenous person living in this great city, I ask to, to all of you, where, where is the Indigenous areas of this city, of Toronto? While the city bears the name of Takuranto, which it comes from the Mohawk language, the city has largely displaced indigenous identity. The development of this space is a step towards restitution. And if I can speak for the diversity of the city, I can tell you that newcomers and immigrants like myself want to see nothing more but the creation of this space. Lastly, last but not least, this space will give the city a stronger sense of identity, in my opinion. We have called the project the restoration of identity. And in a way, it's an, uh, it's an opportunity for the city of Toronto to restore its own identity and celebrate indigenous culture, which has been such a long, uh, which has had such a strong influence on the city. Thank you. Uh, questions of the deputants? No. Speakers? Questions of staff? Does anybody have questions of staff? No. Speakers? Sorry, I was going to ask a question of staff. Okay. Councillor Choisey? Um, October 2018, our are plans going accordingly? Through the chair, um, yeah, uh, planning's proceeding well for the October 9 to 11 event. Um, I brought along Emma Stewart, who's uh, the city staff working on the event. Uh, as Theo mentioned, uh, there's tens of thousands of people anticipated. Local partners like the Sheraton are engaged. Uh, funding has been assembled by Council Fire, and the city has provided a seed commitment of. 30,000 through an Indigenous program, and this report speaks to an additional 250 from the major uh, significant event reserve fund uh, to enable the success of the event. Sorry, Dan, Councillor Tracy, yeah. Councillor Davis, see your questions, staff. Um, just to clarify that, the 250 is from the reserve is for the October event but the additional 250 for the actual legacy project is, has to come yet yeah, through the budget process. Through the chair, that's entirely correct, Councillor. Right. The so second- the capital expense. Nope, the second 250 in 2019 will be from MSURF as well. Uh, the report speaks to its purposes in planning, consultation, and programming. So it would be anticipated that uh, there might be the opportunity to have another significant event in 2019 prior to the 2020 groundbreaking for the event. So that, but, okay, so the capital costs are still yet to be identified and brought through the plan, the budget process. Through the chair, the capital costs for the state of good repair work below grade are accounted for and spoken to in the report from my colleagues at facilities management any additional capital contribution above grade. Uh, Council Fire has indicated uh, their intention to raise those funds uh, and the city will support uh, as, uh, as is right. I don't know if my colleagues from facilities want to add anything. Through the chair, that is correct. So it will be brought forward in the budget with this. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, speakers? Councillor Choisey? 
I just want to thank you for the great presentation. It's probably the best presentation I've seen here. Um, uh, I'm just, you know, it is very much part of our, our identity, as you said, and uh, I look forward to that happening this fall. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Um, I think um, this is going to be an absolutely beautiful addition to our most important civic square. And I think the prominence of the location um, will serve to reinforce the importance of the message. And uh, I think that um, you know, the recommendations uh, that came out um, uh, to uh, ensure that every capital city has some kind of uh, large prominent reconciliation was an excellent one. And if this can be our contribution um, to uh, contributing to uh, significantly to the process of reconciliation, then I think the city um, has no choice but to go ahead with it. I, I think we must, as the largest city in Canada, do something that is important and significant, and I think this will be. So thank you for all of your work. Uh, and uh, the video was beautiful, and so is the, the project itself. And uh, again, just thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Any other speakers? No? Okay. Um, I do have a motion. I want to start by saying uh, miigwech to everyone. Thank you um, for... Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the third person that was supposed to make a deputation is here. Uh, this is Andrea Chris John, board designate at Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre, if we have time for that. Yep, we have time. So, thank you. Oh, could we, Mr. Chair, can we move to extend the agenda, to finish we did. the agenda? Yeah. Oh, we did. We did. Oh, good. You probably just don't remember voting for it. We've been very busy this morning. <laughs> You're still in the room. I saw your hand go up. I want to say, and I wanted to add that what that is in my language, I'm Ongwahongwe or Haudenosaunee, is to acknowledge uh, my uh, well regards to each of you and, and your families. Uh, I apologize for being late, uh, and there is no excuse, parking, maybe when that part will be parking. But I know with the, the project that we're lending towards, and I see that by the number of, uh, of um, shootings that are occurring in the city, that it's really important that we, we look for other ways and means of, of uh, providing our young people as well as uh, the, the mixed uh, diversity of our community is really critical for us, and thus, the space which we call the teaching, learning, sharing, and healing allows uh, all individuals to have that uh, opportunity to um, have some acknowledgement and restore their own identity and have uh, and part and parcel of that we can understand our, uh, our uh, Indigenous base of, of peace and harmony. And, and having said that, I want to build on, uh, on Patrick's uh, comments for the infrastructure, and I'm really, I'm really happy and proud to say that uh, the commitments that we have thus far is 1.5, and that's uh, for the infrastructure, and that's from the, the, the province. Uh, we have uh, 250,000 that was just committed by the, by the um, Anglican Church on Friday. We have 100,000 that was also contributed by the United Church. 75,000 was also contributed by the Jesuits, and the Lutherans have not uh, identified uh, a fund, but we're hopeful that they'll surpass the, the 250 that's, that's there. In addition to, uh, we're outreaching the corporations, the corporations such as Hydro One, and they've made a commitment uh, of 300,000, 150 for this event, but also 150 for the, for the venture itself. This is really an exciting opportunity, and I think it's a buy-in for everyone, not just, not just the Indigenous people. And uh, it's clearly uh, important for us to, to involve and, uh, and bring into our fold uh, peoples of, of the four colors that, uh, that our, uh, our particular mission statement uh, looks to. And uh, where we are um, showcasing this, this particular site as a champion across not just uh, uh, the, the upper part of the turtle, but also south of the Great Lakes. 
and we're going to have colleagues come in uh, from uh, um, from BC as well as Alberta because they really like the concept. They can borrow the turtle concept, but they have to pay for it. And so it's I think it's really important that we want them to have, be a part of our process. <coughs> this weekend, uh, this weekend we have. Uh, uh, a commitment to speak to the Muslim, the national Muslim uh, components too as well, because this is about all of us, not just, uh, not, again, as I say, not to repeat myself, the indigenous population, but it's really important that when we have, uh, you have an understanding of the this peace garden, this, or I should say the adjacent to the peace garden, it's just a real perfect fit and looks for ways and means of how we live together in harmony and peace and how do we look at uh, really supporting our children, uh, our elderly, you know, our families and, and the city that we all love. And uh, so with that, I just wanted to say, you won't go, you know, to each, each of you I know. Um, Mr. Ainsley, you said uh, miigwech, but in the language, it's always remember, you won't go. You know, so I see you won't go for having, giving us this opportunity at this table to present uh, our presentation to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are any questions of the deputy? Councillor Choisy? I'll move the recommendations. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to speak briefly. Um, first of all, Miigwech for um, the, the presentation this morning. I do have a, a motion that staff are trying to work on because I think it's important that the presentation, the video that you gave made this morning, um, I think it's important that it be shown at City Council uh, later this month. I, so the staff are trying to finesse their way through that motion to make sure the presentation, the video is shown at City Council. Um, I want to thank you for coming in here this morning. Um, not only as the chair of government management, as the city councillor, um, I'm, I'm fortunate in in my ward. I have the second highest indigenous population in my ward in, in the that's in the city of Toronto. Um, so I know how important it is um, that this monument and this uh, park area be done. Um, I talk a lot about the Indian residential school system in my ward. Uh, I've taken my children. There's a very um, poignant um, display at the ROM last year, and I encouraged anybody that I talked to to go and see it um, because I think when we talk about our residential school system and the horror and the, the trial and tribulations that children went through being pulled apart from their families, I think it needs to be recognized. Um, as the Chair of Government Management Committee, the space where the, we're going to use for, for the IRSS Legacy Project, originally that was going to be a restaurant. And we decided not to put the restaurant there. And people at the beginning after we got rid we killed that project, and people said, you know, what are you going to do there? It's vacant. It's right beside City Hall. It's right at Queen Street. And I always used to say to people, we're going to figure out. We're going to put something there. It's going to be beautiful. And with the, um, the uh, IRSS project, we have something that's going to be beautiful. Beautiful on one hand, um, but also as somebody that's born and raised in this country, um, it's a little bit embarrassing as well that we have to do something like this to recognize our residential school system. Once again, the horrors that children were put through and families being separated from their children. Um, but as you can see from the video, I think it's, a pro it's gonna be a beautiful project. I think it's an excellent use of uh, that piece of our Nathan Phillips Square that as you can see from the video, if you walk, as you walk through from Queen Street, through the gardens, to the Peace Gardens, to the back, um, through that part of City Hall on the grounds, it's, it's really gonna be striking and I wanna thank everybody for all of their work that they, that they put into it and are gonna continue to put into it and um, I'm looking forward to its completion and I'm looking forward to the, the celebration in next October. So thank you very much. So my motion's on the screen that City Council, as part of its consideration of this item on July 23rd, 2018, view the video submitted by the Toronto Council of Fire Native Culture Centre presented to Government Management Committee on July 3rd, 2018. All in favour? Item is amended. All item is amended. All in favour? Carried. All right. And now we're... Yep, so we're just gonna go back to 
Uh, GM 29.10, I have a motion that staff have worked out for me so that we don't have to go in camera on that one. And I think it, um, so there's five uh, pre-OMERS pension plans that we have here that we're working at bringing under OMERS direction. And I think that um, the one that's outstanding, there's some work that needs to continue on that and how we can look at uh, working with OMERS to make sure it's properly administered, that we have not having city staff administering this committee. The, so with the motion I'm putting forward, it's continuing negotiation with OMERS on how we can uh, deal with that. Um, but the goal is to have OMERS look after it or administer it, but the committee that's in place now will continue to be in place. Councillor Davis. Okay. Do you want to ask staff now or do you want to go on camera? Okay. Is that an in-camera ask or? Through the chair, I, I can certainly answer. The implications of this is that we would talk with OMERS as to what they might do for this plan. issues that complicated it um, and those issues I got the sense from your report should be left better left alone than to open them up and so that I don't I don't know whether this is wise maybe we should talk in camera about it through the chair, that, that would be a good idea. Okay, okay. I'm fine with that. Um, Councillor Davis, still, you still need to go on camera number 23? Uh, yes, because it's an in-camera report. Okay, and number 29? <clears throat> Hold on. Where am I? 29 is the Integrated Telecommunications Infrastructure yes. Agreement. Right, and 23, oh, 23 I don't need to. I got my questions answered. Okay. So I'm happy to move the uh, recommendation. Okay, so you're moving the recommendations on number 23? Which is the relocation of M uh, ML Ready Mix concrete batching facility and the purchase of 29 Judson Street. Okay, all in favor of the recommendations number 23 moved by Councillor Davis, carried. So then we're going into camera number 10 and number 29. Yep. Motions. Yeah, I do. So I have two motions I'm moving. Government Management Committee recess its public session to meet in closed session to consider this item as it relates to commercial and financial information. It belongs to the City of Toronto and has monetary value or potential monetary value. That's for item number 29. So all in favor of the motion on the screen. Carried, and then yes, and then the motion on number ten. Government Management Committee recess its public session to meet in closed session to consider this item as it relates to the security of property belonging to the City of Toronto. All in favor? Carried. So in a nutshell, what we've done is anybody that uh, members of the public need to leave the room and any staff that don't have an interest uh, in items number 10, which is merger of pre-OMERS pension plans with OMERS and proposal for sharing of surplus funds, and number 29, integrated telecommunication infrastructure agreement uh, need to leave the room. Thank you very much. Welcome back, Francis.
Where's Carol? Where's Carol? Do you have an employee of sound that's up to me? I can't, I can't function without Carol. Okay, I'm Craig calling the meeting back to order. All right, I'm calling the meeting back to order. Uh, we're going to start with number 10. I had a uh, motion on the table, uh, which I'm going to withdraw based on questions and comments from staff at the in-camera session. Um, all in favor of withdrawal of the motion? Yes. Carries. Francis, back to you. I, so GM uh, 20... 29.10, all, all in favor of the recommendations in the report. Carries unanimously. Uh, item number 29, integrated telecommunication infrastructure, ITI agreement, uh, held by Councillor Davis. Did you want to speak, Councillor? Did you want to move the recommendations in the report? Councillor Davis is moving the recommendations in the report on item number 29. All in favor? Carries unanimously. Bills. Who has the bills? Councillor Davis? Councillor Davis, as your last official role or item as the Government Management Committee, I'm asking you to move the bills. Uh, that the Government Management Committee pass and declare as a bylaw a confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Government Management Committee acting under delegated authority at meeting 29 held on July 3rd. What did we do under delegated authority here? <laughs> I've got an, I can't leave without another question. <laughs> question of the mover. <laughs> All in favor, recorded vote. Let it be noted in the minutes that Councillor Davis's last motion that she moved on the Government Management Committee was carried unanimously. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Davis, motion to adjourn. Yes. All in favor of adjourning? Carried. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay.